Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're going to start this afternoon's meeting. We'll start, as we always do, with the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Great. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, please consult our schedule on our uh, meeting schedule on our website. Um, for, and Sorry for the barking dog. Uh, for the uh, schedule for the rest of the month. It is a very busy meeting um, uh, and busy month for meetings. Um, we do have a, a, as in next week, a primary care advisory group meeting scheduled in the evening. And I do think we have a prescription drug technical advisory group. I don't have it in front of me, but Robin, you'll confirm later in the month as well. And that's located again on that press release, so please consult that. Um, I also have, um, just to reiterate, I've, I've mentioned this pretty much every meeting, but I think it's very important that folks are again. We have an ongoing public comment for a potential subsequent agreement for uh, with, the, with CMMI for an all-payer model um, that is located on our website under our special public comment uh, um, and that is ongoing and we encourage folks to please submit any comments regarding a potential subsequent agreement. We uh, will definitely consider those and most importantly, we'll pass them along to our partners over at AHS and the governor's office who will be taking the lead in the negotiations on, on a potential next agreement. And I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. I know um, Mike Barber has some announcements as well. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next, we'll turn to our general counsel, Mike Barber, to make some announcements regarding insurance rates. Thank you. Um, so I need to announce that uh, two rate decisions by the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and two rate four rate filings, actually. So on February 10th, 2021, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont in the Vermont Health Plan submitted a consolidated rate filing for their large group plans. Uh, the filings are projected to affect approximately 5,800 members in 36 groups. After the carriers corrected an error relating to the development of the administrative charge, uh, the board approved the filing, which is now expected to result in an average premium change of minus 1.7% effective in the third quarter of 2021. Due to the nature of the large group rating formula, the actual rate change for any particular group or even averaged across groups may differ from that expected minus 1.7% average change. Uh, on February 12th, 2021, MVP Health Plan Inc. submitted a rate filing for its large group point of service riders. These riders are purchased in conjunction with MVP's base large group major medical coverage. Um, there are six members currently with these riders. The filing requested an average proposed rate of minus 3.4% and the board uh, has approved that filing as submitted. And then on May 7th, 2021, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and MBP Health Plan Inc. submitted <clears throat> rate filings for their 2022 individual and small group plans. Um, for 2022, the individual and small group markets are being unmerged, as you know, to take advantage of significantly enhanced federal subsidies that are available under the American Rescue Plan Act to individuals who purchase their insurance through the exchange. Um, because the markets are being unmerged, the proposed rate changes differ for individual and small group plans. So for small group plans, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has proposed a 7.8% decrease and MVP has proposed a 5% increase. For individual plans, Blue Cross has proposed a 7.9% increase and MVP <coughs> has proposed a 17% increase. Again, because of the expanded subsidies that are available to individuals who purchase through uh, Vermont Health Connect, the exchange, these increases will be offset by increased federal subsidies. Um, and consumers are encouraged to use 
Vermont Health Connect's plan comparison tool to understand what subsidies they may be eligible to receive. And uh, representatives from the Department of Vermont Health Access will be presenting to the board on the ARPA subsidies on June 2nd. Um, the filings are currently open for public comment. A public hearing will be held on each filing. The hearing on MVP's filings will be held on July 19th, starting at eight o'clock in the morning. The hearing on Blue Cross's filing will be held on July 21st, starting at eight o'clock in the morning. And on July 22nd, the board will hold a public comment forum to hear from Vermonters on the filings. Uh, these hearings are expected to take place virtually this year again, and more information on how uh, to participate will be available on the board's website. Thank you, Michael. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, May 5th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Member Holmes and seconded by Member Pelham to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 5th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those, op those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show they passed unanimously. At this point, I'm going to turn um, the meeting over to Russ McCracken for a discussion on the guidance regarding the ACO executive compensation and a possible vote. Russ. Thank you, Chair Mullen. <clears throat> Returning to our discussion from last week um, regarding some uh, guidance on executive compensation under the ACO Oversight Rule 5.0. Um, since last week, there's been no public comment. Uh, there's no changes to the proposed guidance, and uh, I've not made any changes to the slides here from uh, what we reviewed and discussed last week. Uh, this guidance is picking up from our discussion, says that an ACO must structure its executive compensation uh, to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. Uh, and it's guidance under Rule uh, 5203A, which is part of the ACO's uh, certification requirements. Uh, we had <clears throat> noticed it this week as a possible uh, potential vote and some proposed motion language is included here uh, for the board's consideration. Are there any questions of Russ from the board? Is there any public comment? If not, would a board member wish to make a motion? I will move that uh, we approve the interpretive guidance of our rule five and five, section 5.203A regarding the requirements for the structure of executive compensation in the form presented um, to us in this presentation. Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved by member Lunge and seconded by member Pelham to approve the language as you see on the slide in front of you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. At this point, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to Elena Baraby and Marissa Melamed for an introduction to a discussion on the core competency of high-performing accountable care organizations. Elena, Marissa. Thank you, um, Chair Mullen. Um, so I'll introduce our next topic in conjunction with um, Marissa will lead us through kind of a kickoff of this year's guidance. So we're kind of considering these items together and separately. 
Um, but I wanted to introduce um, our guest speaker, Michael Bailich. Uh, following yet last year's ACO budget review cycle, staff debriefed to think about how we could kind of redirect the conversation and make sure we don't lose sight of the big picture. And so we came to um, this concept of core competencies. It's a concept that already exists, even for ACOs. Um, and on the national stage, they're kind of there's a whole literature around what makes a high performing ACO. So, you know, we invited Michael Baylett to help us think through this and to provide his national context um, and any recommendations he has for how we might incorporate the idea of ACO core competencies into our ACO regulatory process. Um, so we see this as a start to kind of a, a longer term objective, but we wanted to bring him here today to share the great work that he's done um, and to help us think through how we might evolve our guidance this year and perhaps next year and, and onwards um, to kind of, you know, capture these elements. So, Michael, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon, members of the board. Um, uh, Elena, should I pull up my presentation or is someone doing that for me? Um, if you can, just so you can go at your own speed, but we're happy to assist if, if there's any trouble. So you should okay. have the ability to share. Okay. Um, All right. It's coming up right now. And we see it. <laughs> Great. All right. That's success. Yes. All right. Well, good afternoon again. Um, uh, this is what I'm going to cover in my presentation. Uh, I uh, just want to remind you, I, I looked, it's been almost a year to the date that I presented to you last. Um, just as a reminder, um, we are a, a health policy um, consulting firm that helps states maximize health system performance. Um, we've worked in most of the states since our inception 24 years ago, and, and actually Vermont, um, it's one of the very first states that we work with back in 1997, and uh, we've worked with uh, Bishka initially on regulatory oversight of health plans, and really back to 2014 with the GMCB uh, first on its ACO pilot, and then since then on uh, implementation of a regulatory strategy. So I, I'm going to open by talking a little bit about ACOs in Vermont and the Vermont ACO market because it is. Um, the, the market that is is um, distinctive from other states, and I just want to note um, how that is the case, uh, and then we can talk later about what implications that has for the work that you do. So I, I don't think there's another ACO market that looks like Vermont's. Um, I think that's pretty easy to say, and because of that, um, you all as the board and the public um, really apply special scrutiny to the ACO market uh, and you apply your regulatory authority um, uh, based on um, the distinctive um, uh, role of the ACO market. Yet at the same time, the core competencies for an HO ACO to be successful in Vermont really are not different than they are in any other state. Uh, and so I, I just I want to draw that distinction. Um, ACO, the ACO market in Vermont looks quite different, but to be successful as an ACO um, really isn't so different. Uh, and so I'm going to start by reviewing a few of the distinctive characteristics of uh, One Care Vermont. Um, and then I'm going to uh, go through the core competencies that really apply to any ACO in any state. So um, here's how um, One Care differs from ACOs in the rest of the country. Um, it, um, it covers a significant percentage of the state's population. I don't know of any other state that has a single ACO in it, uh, let alone a single statewide ACO. Uh, two, it has a statewide network of providers, so that in and of itself is unusual to have a statewide network. But, uh, but further, I want to note an important characteristic, which is that um, it's comprised of um, a large hospital system with many other independent hospitals and other providers. So it's it's a it's a broad network that has lots of independent actors who are a part of it. The service area, as you all know, is largely rural. Um, 
the care management model that OneCare operates um, is significantly decentralized. Um, that's different than most ACOs. Uh, it participates in a state-based primary care initiative in the blueprint and, and has right from the beginning. Um, that's another distinctive characteristic. Uh, it partners with many non-medical providers. Um, while that's becoming a little bit more common as um, ACOs focus upon uh, social risk factors and social determinants of health, uh, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite notable that, uh, that One Care began doing this much earlier and much more broadly than other ACOs have done. Uh, another distinctive characteristic is the attempt to employ global budget arrangements with participating hospitals. Global budget arrangements are not common in the United States. Uh, they really are part of public policy in just a few states, uh, and they are uh, they're not frequently employed uh, by ACOs as a subcontracting mechanism. And then finally, um, as you all know, um, uh, one care and frankly any ACO based on your regulation uh, is actively regulated by the state. I would say uh, probably more so than any other state, although there certainly are some states that are active in the regulation. Uh, and, um, and it's subject to a great deal of public scrutiny, far more than what one would observe in another state. So um, these are just um, some distinctive characteristics and, and um, some of you or some members of the public might might perhaps want to argue some of these points or add additional ones, but these are uh, some of the characteristics that jump out to me. Okay, so uh, before going through the core competencies, I want to share a little bit about what we know about the characteristics of high performing ACOs. I want to acknowledge that while the ACO concept has now been around for a little while, uh, there's not a tremendous amount of rigorous evaluative work that's been done on the effectiveness of them. And where it has been done, it leans heavily towards those participating in the Medicare program because the evaluations have been federally funded. Uh, still, there is information that's available uh, and information that I think is relevant uh, for you to be aware of and to understand. So I want to share a little bit about uh, what we know before talking with you about um, suggested core competencies. So first, um, ACOs to date have achieved savings primarily by moving care from lower, from higher to lower cost sites and reducing discretionary testing, imaging, and procedures. And uh, higher to lower cost sites, primarily moving uh, people out of hospitals and away from skilled nursing facilities. Um, a lot of the focus for ACOs has been on management of high-risk patients, but the evidence to date does not show that most savings are coming from management of high-risk patients. Again, that's evidence to date. And I, as I said earlier, you know, there are some limitations in terms of what we know. There's also um, uh, information regarding the profile uh, of uh, successful ACOs in terms of their ownership. And uh, the ACOs that have demonstrated the greatest success have been physician-led ACOs, not hospital-led ACOs. Physician-led ACOs um, in uh, this particular analysis represented um, um, a significant number, in fact, the greatest number of ACOs, and their cost saving strategy has been focused on reducing hospital utilization. They have no economic conflict of interest in pursuing that strategy, uh, and so it's, it is easier for them to pursue than a hospital-led ACO, which can feel self-conflicted because it has both an incentive to fill and empty beds at the same time. And the hospital-led ACOs have tended to emphasize reduction in post-acute care costs. It's especially true for Medicare because those post-acute care settings are most heavily used by Medicare beneficiaries. And then finally, there are a number of joint hospital physician uh, ACOs that exist, and um, they try to do both. But uh, as I noted, um, the economic incentives are a little bit more um, confusing and sometimes conflicting for those organizations. 
So the profile of the most successful ACOs, of what we know so far, physician-led, they tend to be smaller in size. They have very strong leadership. Um, and they tend to have had uh, multiple years of management under risk. Uh, there's a, a lot of evidence that seems to suggest that having a lot of years of managing risk is a predictor of success. And they are uh, committed to uh, continuous improvement in quality. So this is what we know so far. I say so far because I think what we will know in the future will be different, but that's what we know so far. Um, I, I, the last thing I wanna note on characteristics of high-performing ACOs is um, they have to initiate significant change in culture um, and in delivery of care. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a super challenging, complex undertaking for provider organizations because they really need to redefine what is the business that they're in uh, and, uh, and how do they go about executing it in, in really fundamental ways. So uh, I just, I'll just underscore, this is hard work. Okay, so um, this is the, the feature content I'm gonna to share today, the ACO core competencies. We um, identified the set of core competencies at um, the request of Elena and her colleagues. Um, and what we've identified are both structural and operational characteristics of highly performing provider organizations that successfully manage population health. We've grouped the core competencies into five areas. Uh, and within each, um, there are um, subcomponents. So I'm going to give you an overview of what we've identified. You might ask, well, how did you identify these core competencies? Well, these are the steps we took. We did a, a very thorough review of the literature, um, looking at both um, uh, highly structured evaluations with control groups, but also observational studies because um, there, there just isn't that much rigorous research uh, to identify um, in both control studies, but in observational studies, what seems to be associated with success. We also consulted with uh, subject matter experts, and you can see them listed here. Um, one, a physician um, who served as the CMO and, and chief information officer for a large safety net ACO in Massachusetts, and who now directs the population health program for a, uh, an even larger ACO in the state. We talked with a former CEO of an ACO who was a, was a physician executive, and we spoke with the director of Minnesota Medicaid's ACO program. Finally, um, we have conducted a couple of um, evaluations of, of Medicaid, specifically ACO programs, uh, one for MACPAC, which is the advisory body to Congress on Medicaid and CHIP, and another for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so um, we drew more, general, more generally from that experience as well. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, go through the, uh, the five domains that I identified and give you um, a little bit of information on what would be the core competencies within each. And this is obviously uh, an overview presentation. So we start with governance and management. And um, I really wanna underscore having strong leadership and strong management is successful. This is true, of, frankly, of any type of organization, public or private, but it's, it's also true for a successful ACO. And I just think it, it needs to be underscored because um, the leadership provides both the, the vision and the culture as well as um, the, um, the um, excellence in executing on a strategy. And so um, excellence in governance and management uh, has got to include um, driving an organization towards a, a, a vision of high performance. Um, and that means having a clear vision and having a clear strategic plan uh, and, and understanding what are going to be the successful um, levers for generating value. Uh, because that's what this this business is all about is, is generating value both in terms of improved population health status and um, slowing healthcare spending. The um, successful uh, ACO should have a management team that's highly experienced uh, and uh, that's uh, that's highly skilled, and that's that's sort of uh, an essential. 
Uh, there should be uh, communication that's transparent within the organization about the vision uh, and the strategies of the organization. And there should be uh, rigorous assessment of financial risk and how to mitigate it. So we start with um, the governance body and the management team uh, because without strong leadership and competency here, it certainly is uh, difficult, if not impossible, to execute on the other core competencies. Second domain we've titled Provider Engagement and Network Management. Uh, this starts with translating the organization's culture at the governance and leadership level um, into um, the uh, delivery system uh, and throughout the network. And as I noted earlier in the case of uh, OneCare right now, um, this is more challenging because of the breadth of the network and the independence of many of the members of the network. Uh, much more complicated, for example, than if the ACO um, was essentially um, a medical group where every physician was employed. Okay, In that case, it's easy to communicate message and to execute strategy. The communication here to the network is, uh, is more challenging. So um, specific um, elements of this domain are um, that I want to draw out um, is um, developing relationships and holding the network financially accountable for performance. I'm going to come back later uh, on, on how best to do this. But, um, but having financial accountability that's not just held at the ACO level, but also held within the network is important. And, uh, and this next bullet gets a little bit into how to execute that. Um, what we've observed in best practice organizations is that the network is um, when it's not just one organization, um, and sometimes even when it is, if it's a very large one, that the, the network is deconstructed into local or regional teams, where at the team level, there's leadership and resource allocation uh, and financial accountability. So rather than just holding the whole network accountable, um, there are subunits, usually geographically defined within the network, that have their own management leadership and their own uh, financial accountability and incentives and disincentives. Uh, um, third, um, to the extent that there is some choice, there's communication of a network of high performing preferred providers for referrals. In many parts of Vermont, there are few choices, uh, but where there are choices, there is uh, there are differences in terms of value. And when I say va value, I mean both in terms of uh, price and quality. Uh, and where there is difference and where there is choice, that information is conveyed to the network so that care can be directed to where the greatest value can be delivered. And finally, um, there needs to be um, implement implementation of value-based payment models with the network and support to providers to transition to it. So I talked earlier about um, some of the uh, efforts to try to do um, global budgets with hospitals. Um, by one care. Uh, but um, the underlying concept here is that there needs to be a payment model that moves away from fee for service. It's what I sometimes refer to as the payment under the payment in an ACO. So the ACO has a payment model and they've got a, a shared risk arrangement. But if the providers that comprise the network are still being paid on a fee for service basis, then the payment model really hasn't changed in a fundamental way because the risk is being borne at the ACO level, but the economic incentives for individual providers who are part of the network remain the same. And that has to change over time or the efforts to slow spending growth won't be realized, let alone um, objectives around quality. The third domain has to do with engagement of the patients who are served by the ACOs. And, uh, and this um, involves um, engagement at multiple levels. So it's, it's engagement in governance and in other bodies. And uh, the word um, robust here uh, is purposeful because oftentimes um, there's a going through the motions effort to in, involve uh, patients that does not substantively change care delivery. And so by, by robust, we mean that uh, this is subs, 
substantive participation. Um, it, it should be that a patient experience informs um, care delivery and improvement in care delivery. Um, there are multiple modalities for engaging patients, and certainly during COVID, we learned about many new ways and, and strengthened um, our ability to deliver care in new ways. So um, this, is, this is delivering care um, now uh, virtually, electronically, in person, and multiple ways in all three of those categories. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, it's about supporting the network providers to deliver truly patient-centered care. Uh, and, and I will say patient-centeredness is a term that gets used a lot, but not um, actualized as often. The, uh, the fourth of the fifth domains is population health management. I have three slides on this topic, and I think that speaks to the importance of this domain. Uh, and I've, I've started here with a, a quote um, on, uh, from the Healthcare Transformation Task Force, and it emphasizes uh, the need for a complete domain uh, paradigm shift uh, for providers. Uh, traditionally, um, healthcare delivery um, has been um, a, a reactive activity where providers respond to patients who appear and address a need and then discharge the patient. That's not the paradigm for a successful ACO that's doing population health management. Uh, it is, uh, is much more proactive and continuous. Uh, and it's, it's looking at populations of patients, not at individual patients one by one. And that's just a profound change. I think that uh, Vermont benefited by having the blueprint for health um, implemented with primary care practices, but that was only with primary care practices. So, um, I think that uh, you can see here, it says ACOs need to understand their patient population, which certainly involves um, uh, both uh, patient-centered engagement, but also um, heavy use of data, uh, and then application of the data for patient care. Improvement of clinical pathways speaks to the ways in which conditions are managed, and pathways suggest that there are standardized ways of care delivery. We have not, uh, in our U.S. healthcare system, been very good about um, systematizing healthcare delivery uh, and delivering care the same way that's consistent with evidence-based guidelines. But uh, highly effective ACOs should be systematizing care delivery while remaining sensitive to patient-specific characteristics. And then finally, engaging the entire care continuum uh, is so that patients are not wandering station to station, which, um, as we know, many patients with illness experience. Uh, and, and what the ACO should be able to do is uh, bring together the continuum of care so that it is continuous from the patient's experience. So um, key uh, competencies for ACOs are listed here. Um, the, the issue with with everything that's listed on this slide um, is not doing these activities, it's doing them well. Uh, and I think doing them well is really the, the holy grail for ACO uh, performance. There's a great degree of difficulty in exercising these tasks well. Um, even in a closed controlled delivery system environment, uh, which certainly doesn't exist in Vermont today. So I, I'm not I'm not gonna read through um, all the bullets here. These should be, though, familiar things to you. Advanced primary care, um, uh, addressing the needs of patients with complex needs, addressing social risk factors. Um, so th th there's there's nothing that's new here, but the ability to perform at a high level in all of these areas is challenging. Um, I, I want to call out um, at the bottom of the slide one concept that I think is important, and, and this is um, how to deliver care management. So uh, I'm, uh, care management is a term that gets used all sorts of ways across the US. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, delivery of, or supporting um, the care needs for patients with complex and high intensity needs. And the, um, the best practice ACOs tend to have a centrally structured um, program where there are defined protocols for how to do this, but 
with locally embedded care management. So the care management function is close to the uh, practice team and to the patient, but it's not a whole bunch of care managers who are all out improvising on their own. Uh, it's all, uh, uh, to borrow a theatrical reference, it's, uh, it's a bunch of care managers who are following a script so that there is um, a strategic, consistent application of the care management role. And that's hard to pull off. Again, especially hard to pull off in a broad um, network model that's got the regional spread um, that's true in Vermont today. And all of this supported with a technology platform that provides a tool to the care managers and to the practices. The population health program should be um, also providing support to practice teams to transform the way care de is delivered. The blueprint began doing this with primary care practices a long time ago, but care transformation needs to occur throughout the network. It's not just about primary care. I think too often we put the burden of uh, managing care upon the shoulders of primary care practices alone, and that's a mistake. Uh, the next sub bullet here speaks to standardized protocols. These are the clinical pathways I was talking about. Um, I, ideally, they should be embedded in provider EHRs with notification flags and prompts about adherence to protocols. This is harder to do when the network consists of many different EHR platforms. Much harder to do. Uh, and then finally, I, I want to note at the bottom here, um, there should be evaluation of opportunities to reduce low value care. Uh, so these are care, this is, these are services that don't lend any value to patients and in fact can be harmful uh, and certainly drive up cost. All right, and last, um, managing with data. So successful um, healthcare organizations use um, technology and quality improvement, process improvement techniques uh, to make changes based on use of data. And, uh, and that's both for uh, driving down spending growth and for improving quality. Uh, and it means using data at the population level and also at the individual patient level. Uh, those are two very different uses of data, but both are essential and both should guide continuous performance improvement activity at the organizational level, whole ACO, but also within its, its component parts. So the, uh, the uh, practices and hospitals should be using these same uh, types of data tools and quality improvement techniques um, at the individual level as the ACO might be trying to do systemically. So um, this is an overview. Um, and, and just that, uh, but, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the totality of what any ACO in Vermont should be doing to be successful. Um, this, it's, it's in these five areas that the difference between high performance, mediocre, and low performance plays out. Uh, and I would argue that uh, from a, an oversight perspective for the Green Mountain Care Board, these are the areas that you should probably be focusing upon the most. So with that in mind, I want to share um, just a couple of, uh, or a few um, suggestions for your consideration. So Vermont's made a bigger commitment to an ACO strategy than I think any state, and it's therefore appropriate that you have a regulatory structure that's more developed. It's also appropriate that, um, that uh, DIVA, given its commitment to an ACO strategy, has got a major focus on ACO contract management. I believe that um, the adoption, but more importantly, the application of ACO core competencies for both regulatory and for purchasing activity by DIVA um, can help you maximize the value of the all-payer ACO model. And I have two thoughts on how you might do so. Um, and I, I'm sorry, they're both number number one. I thought I fixed that, but that second number one popped back. So first, uh, I think um, you have the opportunity to apply a set of ACO core competencies that focus on the non-financial functions of an ACO. I know that you've had a lot of focus on the financial functions and it's appropriate to have some focus there, but, but ultimately 
it's these non-financial functions that will determine whether uh, one care or any ACO in Vermont is going to be successful over the long term. And so with the core competencies, I think you can evaluate whether any ACO operating in the state uh, is performing well relative to the core competencies and identify where there might be opportunities for improvement. And with those identified opportunities, inform your regulatory actions and uh, DIVA inform its purchasing act actions to drive improved performance in the areas that are critical to success and where you're not getting it right now as a state. And finally, I think the core competencies can be used to assess the value that um, any ACO is delivering to Vermonters and create some transparency around uh, where there may need to be improved performance. The second consideration that I want to offer is that the board would engage subject matter experts who have direct hands-on operational experience leading and managing high-performing ACOs to um, uh, strategically supplement Green Mountain Care Board staff and provide technical expertise and support to periodically assess ACO performance and help you see um, where you might want to prioritize um, uh, some of your regulatory oversight activity uh, and to zero in on areas where um, there's essential opportunity for improvement and where, frankly, you wouldn't be able to identify the opportunities without that technical expertise because it's um, it's too difficult for GMCB staff to do it without having that level of, of hands-on experience and knowledge. So um, that's that's what I've got to present, and uh, I would love to invite uh, your reactions and discussion. Thank you, Michael. We'll start with the questions or comments from the board, board members. I can go ahead and jump in first. This is Robin. If that's okay with you, Kevin. That would be great, Robin. All right. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you. Hi, Robin. Um, nice to see you. I had a, a couple questions. One is on your slide 18, and you had you had talked a little bit about the centrally structured and locally embedded, and that's something that um, uh, I had read about and maybe even talked with you about a, a long time ago. Um, and what's interesting to me about that concept, and I think one of our unique challenges, is how the ACO and the blueprint fit together. Um, because it seems to me like the way we've structured our care management components is that uh, the ACO is providing tools and clinical direction, but it's the blueprint that's actually the practices in the community health teams that doing the hands-on care management. And so um, one of my thoughts, and I would love your reaction to this, is that culturally it it's not only do we need the ACO culturally to be thinking about that, we need the blueprint culturally to be thinking about that because we have these two structures that need to work hand in glove. Um, and whatever kind of clinical leadership at the ACO level is provided needs to also uh, kind of fit into what's happening at the blueprint. So I just love your reaction to that because I think, you know, I, I think our idea there was we don't want to do reduplicate we don't want to duplicate infrastructure we already have, right? right? So that makes a lot of sense in a small state. But by having these two structures that need to really be hand in glove, we've kind of made it harder on ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And, and I remember early on the tension between, you know, not upsetting the blueprint, which, you know, is, is has a long positive track record and implementing the ACO at the whole at the same time. And there was also a lot of tension about giving up local control and autonomy yes. um, and not having the ACO take everything over. Um, this is a hard, um, a hard issue, but I do think that for the care management function to be successful, um, I'll go back to a, a word I used earlier, it has to be more systematized. And I think to the extent that these are um, independent care management initiatives that are being given tools, but really are out on their own doing whatever they think is right, I, I think you give up too much. Yeah, well, that's interesting. 
That's a big uh, cultural change. I know it is. <laughs> I, and, and I know that I'm I'm juggling dynamite when I say that. <laughs> I, I just want to totally acknowledge that, that I know that that is, it's a highly countercultural thing to say. Um, but I have to imagine that there is some way to find um, a, a better melding of the two um, where there's just not complete uh, and maybe it's not complete, but but heavy decentralization the way mm -hmm. there is. Well, thank you. That's that's very interesting. Um, the other question I had was on slide 23. You had some um, where you were you had some suggestions related to uh, both us and uh, Diva as a payer. I was curious if you thought those that uh, the core competency structure could also lend itself well to private payers because of course we have uh, both MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield doing commercial ACO programs um, as well as a small self-insured footprint. So how to think about uh, beyond just kind of the state government actors, how that gets pushed out into the private. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems to me that the uh, that Blue Cross and MVP could probably come together in agreement with uh, GMCB and Tiva about core competencies, uh, and maybe even a process for assessing uh, performance against the core competencies. And to the extent that you could align signals so that if all the players were were signaling the same and partnering the, the same way on, hey, here's an area where we really need to get stronger and see some progress, it, that would certainly be more successful than independent efforts. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Okay. Other board members? Sure. I, I'll hop in. Um, Thanks, Jess. Kevin, uh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. It's always interesting to hear your perspective and to learn so much from your research on this. Um, I really appreciated the buckets and um, starting to think about these core competencies, and I'm really trying to think about how to operationalize them. Uh, at the next level, in the sense that you know our role is to assess performance relative to, let's just say, these core competencies. And it's important, as you said, not to just do these activities, but to do them well, right? The ACO has to do them well. I think defining well becomes where it gets, you know, tricky. So I think about some of these components about, you know, um, you know, fostering a value-based culture or ensuring the leadership is experienced and skilled or ensuring that there's a rigorous, assessment of risk and a robust consumer participation. I'm just thinking about, well, how do we quantify that? What does robust look like? What does that mean? What is, you know, uh, a rigorous assessment of risk? How do we know that it's it's rigorous or not? Um, you know, is there support for transformation? Well, how much support is what we need? I guess I'm just trying to think about operationalizing in a way that allows us to quantify or something to know whether we're meeting metrics so that, or they're meeting metrics so that we know, you know, along these components, there is a high performance level versus just having the checkbox that says, yes, they have a communication strategy. Is it an effective communication strategy? How do we know? So right. I don't know if you could speak to sort of operationalizing these core competencies in a quantifiable way. Yeah, those are great and totally appropriate questions. So this is why um, my second recommendation was for the board to um, strategically engage subject matter experts because I don't think that you can actually make that assessment. I think it's too difficult, but I think that someone who's practiced in the field um, can look closely um, at any ACO at how they do things and identify where there are opportunities for improvement in a way that would just be very difficult for Green Mountain Care Board staff to do. Okay. Um, and, and this is, this is a qualitative assessment that does not lend itself to um, metrics and key performance indicators. And it's, it's really looking at how the organization is doing its work. Um, and uh, it's, it's not an assessment that you're going to be doing um, on a monthly basis. It's something you, you would do you know, periodically, but it's a deep dive periodically. And probably in the areas where there's opportunity, you go back and do a deep dive again the next year. And in the ones that looked really good, you probably don't go and look at them every year. Got it. That's helpful. Okay. But, but, but if, you, if you had some people who could um, complement the, the great team that you've got on staff, and could come back to you and say, here are the three areas that are of concern that we think you should be uh, focusing on, that would give you something that you don't have right now. Yeah, okay. 
Um, a second kind of area of question, a little bit builds on Robin's question around centralized, decentralized, you know, care management, clinical practices. I'm wondering how you, what your sense of research and the literature suggests about risk and whether risk, you know, how risk should be distributed across the network. Should it be, you know, there has been a change in our ACO's um, distribution of risk model from a decentralized to more centralized. And I'm just wondering how, you, you know, what your research suggests uh, optimal risk distribution should be to achieve the kind of delivery system reforms you want to see. Yeah, so you do want it somewhat decentralized. Um, but, you know, there are challenges in doing that. First of all, providers don't like taking risk, right? So um, that's 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 going to be hard for the ACO to pull off. And um, you also have to make sure that when you distribute risk, that you do so in a manner um, that... Um, creates both a meaningful incentive and doesn't put anyone's financial viability at stake, right? And, and you've got lots of small providers serving small populations. So when you have small ends, that means you're going to get all sorts of really bumpy variation in activity. Big populations work much better for risk than small populations do, but you don't have large populations. So um, I think you want to you consider um, uh, this is a threading the needle task. You do want to push yeah. risk down, but you want to do so in an appropriate way. Um, and uh, I, I, I have to imagine that it's been um, difficult for one care to cajole providers to take risk. But, yeah, but if they don't gonna... have it, I just want to note, if they don't have it, then their business model is churning volume. Right. That's the problem. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering, are there best practices on threading that needle? You know, given the size of our ACO and the size of our subpopulations, whether it's at HSA, you know, is there anything we can learn from where this has been done well? And one of the things you said was some of the best performing ACOs are smaller in size. So the size component must have been dealt with, managed well in some other, you know, area. So I'm just I'm kind of wondering, are there best practices of what is it? What does an ideal risk model look like for to balance all of those countervailing forces that you just suggested. Yeah, so I, you know, I think um, uh, I think you want to start with hospitals, and and not with the critical access hospitals, but 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 you want to start with the hospitals, and you would like the hospitals to be on a budget, which I think was the initial vision that you know Todd Moore had at the outset. That that was the right impetus, uh, because that's your biggest locus of spend, and when I look across um, the United States and including the other New England states where healthcare spending is growing fastest, it's um, it's hospital services, uh, and uh, which is both a mix of utilization, outpatient, and prices. So hospital spending is the first area of concern. Um, and then to the extent that there are some um, high volume um, specialty practices. Um, there's an opportunity to do something there next. Um, the, it, this is not a primary care issue, and I know there's been an effort to do prospective payment for primary care. You do that to help stabilize primary care. It's not for managing um, expenditures that you do that with primary care. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. I guess my last question is around um, one of the components was around referrals, ensuring that there was an identification and communication to uh, high performing providers to ensure that referrals are going to those providers that, you know, are, are high quality and low cost. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering how that's operationalized and some of the consequences of that within a network and within a, you know, provider community, particularly if some of our smaller hospitals tend to be higher cost for a whole host of reasons, whether that's low volume or other you know, uh, you know, potential reasons why they might be high cost. How do you start to um, manage that process? Because that's, that's yeah, well, it's it's, it's even it's also difficult when your low cost options are non hospital based services. So yeah, yeah. you know, ambulatory surgery or imaging, you could have it done outside of the hospital at way less than in the hospital. Uh, right. But uh, the hospital is governing the ACO. So, th I mean, this is the the conflicting financial incentives issue that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, those are really tough issues. 
And I mean, you and I, you know better than I do the issue of all of Vermont's hospitals um, and you know the capacity debate. Uh, you know that's that is so hard. Yeah. Uh, but but you know clearly you know there are opportunities to move the locus of care to lower cost settings. Yeah. And that, but, that but realizing that is hard. Should be managing, and in, in some ways, your core competency would be suggesting that the ACO be managing those. Yeah, but, but, I, but you know, I also want to be fair to the ACO. I understand that's that's super hard to do. I mean, the, yeah. the easier thing to do is saying, um, you know, for example, I give you the example of patients going to SNFs after hospitals. And, you know, successful ACOs have saved boatloads of money because they said, you know what, we don't have to send people to SNFs. We can send them home with in-home supports. We save a lot of money. So there are a whole bunch of different um, care location choices, some of them easier, some harder. But but even in that case, the SNF then is losing a bunch of volume, right? right. I mean, and they're going to come complaining to you that the ACO is putting them out of business. So that, you know, the simple, this is the old adage, you know, that someone's health care expenses is someone else's revenue. And right. if you want to slow health care spending, we're not even talking about reducing it. We're just talking about sp uh, slowing it. Um, it's going to require some reapportionment of spending in ways that are painful and, and people are going to come to you about it. Right. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. Other members of the board? Um, I'll jump oh, sure, in I'll here uh, be, oh. because the, the conversation ahead, because the conversation that Jess just had is, is the one that's at the top of my mind. Um, you know, I, I appreciate very much all the work that you did from 2014 to 2017, you know, kind of uh, helping Vermont move the ball down the court. Apparently I wasn't, you know, didn't, didn't have hands on or, or eyes on that as it happened, but I, I, I'm sure that I hear from everybody that, 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 that you were helpful. And um, so, you know, I look down the road now that I, you know, can, can see, and, you know, we have made, progress, I, I think, especially in putting to, putting the infrastructure into play. It's not conceptual anymore. We have an ACO. We have all hospitals involved, but, but grace. We have all insurers, public and private, engaged at some level. Um, some of the FPP, for example, is, is, re is reconciled to, to fee-for-service, but, but they're engaged. Those contracts are in place. We've, we've had risk contracts you know, with providers. But then I look at other statistics like across the hospitals in our last budget process, the level of fixed prospective payment in terms of their uh, net present revenue was only a 14 percent. And um, and and that includes the non real FPP where it gets reconciled. And I I uh, I feel but I don't know that that's not a level that's going to achieve us the kind of economies and efficiencies that are hoped for back in 2017 and, and 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, the, 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 the tool that seems to me to be the one that will allow us the best to follow the flow of money in the system to see where there are opportunities to save money um, is uh, price transparency, and uh, and we don't have that. Uh, we have whatever the CMS did with hospitals, but um, but but the the rest of it is is pretty opaque, um, and so it's hard to kind of like look at this system and say where are the opportunities where there are lower cost providers, and and uh, you know I hear an anecdotes from folks in primary care or for folks in some specialty saying, you know. If you know, we we could compete uh, with uh, UVM Medical Center, for example, but they're just so big, um, and uh, and it's just not a public issue as to how these prices differential. So I'm just wondering, you know, we are where we are now. We've got the infrastructure in play. We have 14, 15 percent fixed prospective payment. Um, you know, how how do we practically uh, you know, move and and we have a hospital driven ACO. And so, you know, at the beginning of your presentation where you're talking about moving care from higher cost to lower cost sites, AKA away from hospitals, 
I just wonder if there's a fatal flaw in this system that somehow we have to correct it um, or we're, we're not going to be able to 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 get the hope for uh, be benefits that uh, that you were looking at in 2017, 2018. Uh, <laughs> you had a lot there, Tom. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to what, what I captured as you were talking. Uh, first is, I think that the penetration rates have to get higher. Um, you know, 14% isn't enough. And I've talked with primary care practices where they said that the percentage of their patients are, you know, 24%, 21%. That's just not enough. Um, to, to change the business model. Uh, so even if you come up with, or the ACO comes up with a new payment model, if that per, that's the sole percentage that they're getting through the new payment model and everything else is fee for service, it's, it's hard to move um, behavior change at that level. Um, yeah, it, in terms of um, having a hospital at ACO, it's harder for a hospital at ACO. There are many of them, and I don't know that it's a fatal flaw, but I think it's important to call out that there are some um, certainly mixed financial incentives that one has that a physician group based one doesn't have. Uh, and there has to be a there has to be a pretty clear strategy that you feel good about to manage around that so that you don't have the ACO not really wanting to empty beds because, in fact, it's it's bread is better buttered, or it's corporate parent breads or bread is better buttered by filled beds and empty beds. Yeah. Um, and so I I I just think you should be explicit um, when engaging with them about that um, conflict and what's their strategy for managing that. So I I wouldn't say you have to blow it up because that's the model, uh, but I I just think it's it's worth calling it out. And, yeah. and taking it on directly, well, that, and holding that, them that, accountable that, for finding a way to 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 manage through it. Yeah. Well, I I feel that conflict. I mean, during uh, the budget process last year, the folks at UVM testified both um, at the hearing and in writing that um, you know they have this cost structure, and it's up to us to figure out how to. Um, um, abide that cost structure and basically pointed at pointing the finger at the insurance companies. But, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I don't think any operation is perfectly efficient and there's always efficiencies that can be found. And, but I don't know where they are without some kind of a, a, a you know, a, a price transparency uh, window to, to, to look, to, to look for them. I mean, there are other issues here too. There's the cost shift. Um, there's the benchmark plan, which I think the state's on a path now to restructure our benchmark plan in, 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 in alignment with our uh, um, you know, health care goals. But uh, I, I just think that we're at a crossroads. We've put the infrastructure in place both at a, a tactical level, but um, you know, moving to the next tier, I think, is, is as you say, uh, is, is going to be a very uh, difficult effort, but at least one that we understand is difficult and therefore can um, engage ourselves to do it. Yeah, well, and it was an enormous lift to put up the infrastructure, right? So I would right. say now focus on how do you make it work, right? Um, right? Because uh, it takes a long time to lift up the infrastructure. Uh, right. And so now I think you just, you want to find a way to maximize performance within it. Right. No, I, I recognize that. And, you know, you have some folks in Vermont that point at the ACO and say, oh, it's not effective yet. But it didn't exist three years ago, <laughs> you know, and putting this infrastructure in place is an accomplishment in and of itself that should be recognized. And uh, I don't think any practical person expected that in 2018, all of a sudden we would, would see the benefits of the ACO. But now it's reasonable for Vermonters to expect the benefits of the ACO. And we have to be pretty clear-eyed about um, uh, figuring out what the moving parts are to move to the next level. Yeah, yeah. And you want to see significant substantive improvement in performance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jess, for asking that question. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Maureen. Uh, sure. First, thank you very much for the presentation. It's uh, always very interesting to hear what you have to say. 
And one of the things I want to touch on, it, it, I think it uh, tags a little on to what Tom was just addressing with the, you know, penetration. But, you know, we, you brought up at the beginning, we have one ACO. And, you know, even as we're referring it to, we talk the ACO. And, you know, I guess, are there risks with just having the one ACO in the state? And are there barriers to entry as we um, continue on the path of only having one ACO? I guess, you, you know, do, do we look at this as, that's what we have and, and, you know, we can make that work or, you know, it's, uh, it's just always interesting to just have the one ACO and, and they're doing well and, and nothing against that. But, you know, I guess from a perspective of someone who looks at a lot of systems, how, how should we think about that? Or So Maureen, your question reminds me years ago when Richard Slusky used to be at the Green Mountain Care Board, he turned to me and he said, are we crazy for doing this? <laughs> um, I, so when when we did the ACO uh, pilot, there were three ACOs in the state, and um, and two of them obviously um, aren't around anymore. I don't know that Vermont is big enough to have multiple ACOs at scale. Um, I, I I really don't. I mean, you know, maybe arguably in Chittenden County you could have a couple. But you know the the population sizes in the rest of the state are just so small. I just, I so I don't think um, <laughs> to answer Richard's question from years ago. I don't think you're crazy to have only one, but if you have only one, it's got to be really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, that's all I've had. But thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Maureen. Kevin, so, I have uh, a follow up, but you go ahead first. Um, go ahead, Robin. I can wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, just on that same topic, Michael, um, as you just mentioned, we the whole conversation about physician versus AC, uh, hospital-led ACO reminded me that we did have a physician-led ACO that was having some good results, but basically once the state no longer was paying for the infrastructure with federal dollars, um, that ACO wasn't able to sustain itself. I'm wondering how that works in other states with physician-led ACOs. Like, how are they paying for themselves, essentially? If you know. Well, so I they, mean, that's what yeah, so they have to find a way to, I mean, there are two questions. How do they capitalize themselves, and then how do they fund their operations? So usually, um, you know, through one way or another, they find a way to capitalize themselves. Um, and then their operations, you know, they're self-sustaining. They will frequently get um, uh, care management or infrastructure payments from the payers, but those are always netted out um, when they're reconciling their performance. So it really functions as no more than an advance, uh, but they become self-sustaining uh, by being able to manage to a budget. So it can happen. Yeah. And that that physician based ACO, it was pretty small. Yeah, it was well, that, small. that was my other sort of thought about it is um, I wasn't sure if if other in other states where they have large physician practices, um, I could see how a large physician practice could kind of move forward with an ACO and that was sort of wondering it, it seems harder to me when you have a bunch of little. Yeah relative so, to other states. I mean, our large practices, we don't have very many of them. They're mostly in Chittenden County. And relative to other states, my impression is that they're still pretty small. Yeah, so I would say it's medical group-based ACOs that are um, more successful. There are IPA models that are a bunch of independent practices strewn together. Um, they're common in California and they're huge there. Uh, but you know, I, I'm coming back to this whole idea of systematizing care delivery, and it's so hard to do that if you've got a whole bunch of, of independent actors. Thank you. Sorry, Kevin. No problem, yeah. Robin. They, 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 Robin, they would have to achieve a high level of integration, uh, I think, in order for it to work. Michael, using uh, um, the criteria that you've developed as far as trying to assess um, high performing ACOs and knowing that one of your recommendations that I heard from you is to seek counsel from people who have been success successful 
in the ACO world. Um, could you give us the names of a few of what you consider to be high performing ACOs? Um, I, I can't off the top of my head, but I would be happy to provide them afterwards. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. And most importantly, what's the significance of the hatchet on the wall? Uh, well, I'll show you the hatchet. <laughs> so um, this hatchet right here, I don't know if you can see who's inlaid in the hatchet. That's George Washington. And so this is a hundred year commemoration of his inauguration in 1789. Very nice. <laughs> Thanks. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public for any public comment, members of the public. And I do see a hand coming up and we'll start with Mort Wasserman. Microphone on, camera on. <laughs> so um, that was a splendid presentation. When I first got interested in ACOs because of my background in child health, I was interested in pediatric ACOs or ACOs at least that had some children in them and how that would inform what Vermont is doing. Because we actually have a lot of kids in our ACO because we have Medicaid is such a big chunk. Uh, and even though the private insurers is much smaller, we have Medicaid is a significant portion of our population. So I was trying to just find out what uh, other ACOs were mixed, like Medicare, Medicaid, and private. And uh, if I was lucky, then which of those had a large rural population? Because we have 60% of our population live in small uh, counties. And what I found out was that I couldn't find out anything. And I asked the, the head of uh, the folks at, at OneCare, you know, what's, what's the you know, where's the national database for ACOs? And I think this informs some of the questions that the board members have had, which is, where do we get advice for our situation, because we're not going to stand up another ACO. We've got one that's going to be very sensitive to its initial conditions. So, and you don't have to, you probably wouldn't be able to answer this question. It's very much like uh, Chair Mullen's question, but is where do we get advice for our situation where we have to keep rural hospitals open or sacrifice rural communities? And we have to keep access and we have to uh, be stuck with a hospital based ACO structure that we have. So maybe a rhetorical question for you. Well, I mean, you know, there are there are many, many states um, that have um, rural regions that are way bigger than Vermont. And and there are ACOs there. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say most ACOs, in my experience, that have been around uh, for more than a couple of years are doing business in Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial because they need to be doing things the same way for all of their lines of business. So um, being in all three is not unusual. Uh, I, I don't think um, that you're going to find, except maybe in Maine, um, mm -hmm. examples of ACOs in New England that have a large rural area. But if you're willing to look outside of New England, then certainly you can find examples. Okay. So I have, I have one more question, if I may, Kevin, if that's okay. Yep. I, I was astounded that the word social determinants of health did not appear in your presentation. Yeah, it's in my and notes. As a, I've, as, I've a retired, as a retired uh, provider, I hate the word, but I'll use it. Um, social determinants are what get people from a primary care situation to an ED and from a from an ED into a hospital. I mean, there's lots of underlying uh, ailments that require hospitalization, but at the margins where you can really affect differences, it's the social supports for families that make the difference. So how can we uh, weave in 
And I think we have a good start on this in Vermont, by the way, the social determinants of health, the, the social uh, circumstances that face families uh, who are uh, covered lives in our ACO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had on slide 19 a bullet referral practices to community-based services, and I wrote social risk factors, but I, I, I didn't actually read that bullet. Um, so what you can do is as a standard practice, you can have not just primary care practices, but others who encounter patients um, uh, do social risk factor screening. And uh, you can then develop uh, protocols for how to connect those individuals using non-clinician members of the primary care team with community resources, which I think is already, you know, starting to happen in Vermont. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll turn to Rick Dooley. All right. Thanks so much. And, and Michael, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, as you know, I, I work for Health First. Um, you know, and we uh, obviously have from our collaborative physicians the, right. the physician-led ACL that we've been speaking of. Um, you know, and it did close because, frankly, there just wasn't there weren't the shared savings. Because what we found is that you know we generally already provide um, you know provided high-quality, efficient care, and it's hard to um, you know increase on efficiency when you're already efficient. Um, but one thing I just wanted to to you know sort of talk about. You know, when I look at your presentation, you said you know physician-led ACOs generally. Uh, do better than hospital-led, um, predominantly by reducing uh, cost, by you know, reducing hospital utilization and going to lower sites of care. In Vermont, we have this really, um, I think, a relatively unique situation where where we really have a lot of monopoly uh, sort of structures, right? We have we have a, no, a monopoly ACO, um, a monopoly, a large dominant hospital system. You know, certainly in Chittenden County, that sort of is spread out. Um, you know, we, they pretty much have a monopoly on imaging. Um, they have a monopoly on orthopedist practices. Um, there are not a lot of options. And when options are raised, like the Ambulatory Surgery Center, for example, um, you know, the sort of quickly, you know, the hospital quickly um, organizes and mobilizes to uh, suppress any, you know, competition. Um, so there aren't any real, you know, as a, as a primary care provider now, if I have someone who has an ankle injury, I don't have an option within Jitten County to send to a non-hospital practice. Um, I don't have an option for non-hospital imaging. Um, I don't have an, a really much option for non-hospital uh, uh, treatment if there's a, a surgery center, because they're, they're not doing those at this current surgery center. So there are a lot of options to, to really drive to lower cost sites of care. Do you have any experience, or are there other areas where they have those same str struggles that we do, where there just aren't those? Is, is the answer that we need more competition or more lower sites, lower cost sites of care, so we have options to send to? Because otherwise, well, I'm so not you, sure exactly how how we could do that. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Rick. I mean, I, I think you have two choices: either you create competition, um, or facilitate it. At least you can't create it, but you facilitate competition by making it easy to get new market entrants. Um, or um, because you have monopolistic uh, players, you beef up the role of state government uh, in overseeing the monopoly. Because my view is the, the role of government is to keep markets functioning. And if a market isn't functioning, then government has to compensate for that because the because a monopolistic organization is not necessarily going to maximize value for um, consumers and other stakeholders. Uh, it's going to do what's in its best interest. And I'm not speaking to any Vermont organizations, just right, in general, right. that's what happens. And so I think in this particular case, if you have only one ACO, the Green Mountain Care Board has to become very involved in pushing accountability, which would include, I will say, um, pushing care out of the hospital and expensive settings into lower cost community settings. I, th I think it's appropriate for the board to do that. Either that or make it easier for um, or, or make it easy for competition to enter the marketplace. Do you think the certificate of need program is uh, or the sort of requirement? I know other states are sort of has gone the the way the wild, but not necessarily here yet in Vermont. Do you think that's an impediment to some of this? Because I feel like it sort of provides a, a floor for 
um, you know, a monopolistic entity to come in and say, here's why I, here's what, you know, to argue against it, as it were. Yeah, so it sort of works both ways, right? The certificate of need keeps you from expanding um, service capacity where you don't need it, and we know that supply drives demand in healthcare, uh, but it can also keep lower cost competitors from coming into the market. So it's a complex question uh, because it cuts both ways. All right. Great. Now, you, you don't want to add, and, and I will note, I mean, these are all complicated issues. Um, if you bring in a low cost alternative that takes margin out of the hospital, um, then the hospital, and, I'm not, and again, I'm not picking on uh, Vermont Hospital. This right. is true any place. The hospital is going to look to make up that revenue elsewhere. Right? So, right. so your net costs may or may not be lower if you introduce a low-cost competitor, your, your system cost. Right. Which begs the question, how much control can you actually have in terms of reducing those costs if you have, if you have a hospital that's just making well, so I, 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 I mean, my feeling is that uh, that if you create um, some budget structure that says we're going to limit how many dollars go into the system, then it forces the need to become more efficient because you can't continue to grow your revenue. Um, and uh, I, I, it's just my personal opinion, but I think that's what the board's got to do because that will create some discipline. Now, there will be some noise then about not being able to attract professionals to come work because we don't pay enough. And yes, but if you really want to slow healthcare spending growth, you have to, you, have, you got to put a cap on growth. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay. Is there other public comment? And Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. This is just a, a, brief, a brief comment. Um, I'm, I was interested in Mr. Ballot's uh, suggestion that you needed to get some uh, expert advice on trying to look at what was actually going on in the delivery field and, and to try and find out how you might move forward. Uh, the reality, I think, it seems to me, is that not only is that expertise not available, uh, is not available in um, in the Green Mountain Care Board. It's also not available in One Care Vermont. If you consider One Care Vermont to be the 70 people on Water Tower Hill, they don't have any ability to do that either. And the uh, and uh, the so the question is really what you do. And it seems to me that the the place that you can make progress is the program you've already started on, which is the sustainability effort. You just don't have any real numbers inside of that yet. I would put that together, the idea of getting those numbers, and put that together with uh, Michael's suggestion about getting expertise on what the delivery system ought, ought, to, ought to look at. The reality is that uh, when he says, well, you've got to keep, it's absolutely true that you've got, to have a, you've got to have a cap here, but there's a huge cap on here already. I mean, over the last, the, uh, the, uh, the amount of margin that isn't across that's available in within the hospital system, uh, the margin is now very close to zero. It's underwater in for 2021, and so the so the cap really is the cap really is in place. And the question is, seems to me, is that you what, what you have to really figure out is what what you want to what you want your system to look like in terms of the way that the medical care is delivered. You have to figure that out first, then you can have to, you're gonna to have to figure out how to pay for it. But I don't think that you can get it. The, I, don't, I don't think you can get it on, I don't think you're on a track to get it. I just don't see any how you're gonna do that. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Um, if I could just remind people that uh, um, the chat function isn't a way for public comment in that if you have something meaningful to say, to, to please say so in during this public comment uh, period, um, and to be respectful when you use the chat function. So um, is there other public comment? Hey, Kevin, it's Walter on the iPhone. <laughs> hey, Walter. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm at work. I couldn't 
get on. Uh, nice presentation. I say thanks. I wanted to kind of pick up on something that Tom said earlier when he's talking about the benefits of the ACO, and I'm curious, what are the benefits of the ACO? And then the presenter, and I've got tractors going around in my ears, so I couldn't hear his name um, as they're working on the working on some construction, but the role of government is not just to manipulate work on the free market or break up monopolies or whatever, but the role of government is a lot more than that. And <clears throat> it's not just to maintain a free market, whatever free market is, because they're never free. Anyway, that's my comment. Sorry if you heard traffic in the background. I know you came through very clearly, Walter. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank you, Michael. It was a great conversation and uh, a lot to chew on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to be with all of you. And at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Elena and Marissa as we continue the conversation and discuss uh, 2022 ACO guidance and um, really um, debrief 2021. So Elena, Marissa. Hi, thank you, Chair Mullen. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Just a minute. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So my name is Marissa Melamed. I'm Associate Director for Healthcare Policy. I'm here with Elena Barby as well, who introduced us. And we're going to continue this conversation um, as a uh, debrief of our 2021 ACO budget um, and certification oversight process, as well as a kickoff for our 2022 season. Um, we're quite thankful to Michael Bailett for being here again this year. Um, it is really helpful to have this conversation in the national context um, as we uh, contemplate the new uh, budget guidance and new budget review season. So hopefully we can weave some of that conversation into the discussion today. Um, Michael, I can't remember if you were able to stick around or not. If you are that, um, and you have anything to um, add, that's great. And if not, um, we can always bring follow-up questions um, that are relevant to Michael's talk that may, may come up during this discussion as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to proceed. Let me um, get this into a better view for you. All right, so our agenda for today, um, we've been through uh, numbers one and two, and now we're going to talk about the debrief and FY22 kickoff. <clears throat> So here's an overview of our approach to the 2022 budget review. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about process, priorities, and outcomes for our uh, budget process for 2022. Um, the process included or continues to include a stakeholder review um, of that included both debrief of our 2021 process, um, as well as we are about to in, embark on stakeholder review of uh, guidance that we're formulating for 2022. Also consists of quite a bit of internal collaboration among Green Mountain Care Board teams um, or, Green, or, or Green Mountain Care Board regulatory processes, um, particularly overlap with hospital budgets um, and rate review to um, better align these processes. Um, as well as a, a collaboration with other state agencies. Um, and the process also includes public and board input. Um, so we bring this discussion to the public as, as we're doing here today to hear from board members and to hear uh, public uh, input. Priorities that have been identified through the process so far that we kind of use as our overarching framing 
Um, uh, number one, um, our ACO financial and quality performance. Um, we are, you know, continually looking to improve um, how we measure and understand um, their performance uh, in the context of our uh, statute and rule and oversight. And, um, you know, as you heard from Michael today, that's partially why we brought him here um, and what this is all about. Um, priorities also include uh, continuous improvement in having our analyses and decisions be data driven. Um, regulatory alignment, as I mentioned, across uh, other regulatory oversight processes with the board, and we are working toward um, more standard reporting and templates, um, including metrics and definitions where appropriate to help us uh, carry the review uh, year over year and understand across the full uh, landscape. Outcomes from this uh, process are, are twofold. Um, since the uh, adoption of the FY21 budget order, um, we have been working on an ACO reporting manual, which as you'll recall was budget order condition number one. Um, the goal here is um, that we collect standard reports on the performance year, year over year. Um, these reports include things like the ACO's network development strategy, um, clinical focus areas, population health and quality improvement reporting, quarterly financial reporting, complaints and grievances, um, and member communications, and other specific reporting on things such as the Comprehensive Payment Reform Program, um, addressing childhood uh, adverse events, also other ad hoc or one-time reports requested by the budget order. Um, so these things we have found are you know, becoming more standard year over year. Um, they've traditionally been in the budget order, um, but if we want to continue to collect them, it makes, them, it makes more sense to have them um, put into a, a central reporting manual. So we have been working on that um, in the off season. The goal here uh, eventually is to allow the budget to submission to be more about the budget year. So what are the assumptions that are being built into the budget um, so that it can be forward looking um, and not so much a performance year reporting. So we're, we're trying to, um, to have um, more clear reporting throughout the year so that when we get to the budget, um, it's, it's forward looking. This isn't gonna happen just in one year. I think it's gonna take um, um, more time than the, just this year to have it separated in that way, but that's sort of the, the goal that we've been working toward um, to make this, this process um, more clear throughout the year. Um, so uh, the other outcome of this process is of course the final guidance for FY22 which today is the kickoff. We will be working on it throughout the spring. We will bring drafts of that guidance to the board in June um, so that it can be uh, reviewed and adopted by the end of June and posted by July 1. I think I got ahead of myself that that timeline is here on this, um, on this slide. We're at May 12th on June 9th. You will hear, you will see the first uh, public um, presentation of the guidance um, and then there will be some more time for public comment, um, another draft with any changes um, and a vote hopefully on June 23rd, but at least by the end of June so that it can be uh, posted by July 1 to allow uh, One Care to prepare their submission for October 1. Just a reminder, I'm here on the slide six, the statutory authority. Uh, when we prepare the budget guidance and the certification form, we review it against the criteria that's set forth under this authority. Um, and that consists of the standards and requirements under uh, 18 BSA 9382, oversight of accountable care organizations, Green Mountain Care Board Rule 5.0, and the all payer model agreement. We spend a lot of time uh, cross-checking um, what goes into the guidance and what goes into the form with the criteria that's laid out in the statute and the rule to make sure that we are covering all those areas. Um, as I've discussed, as you'll recall through the budget review process, um, this criteria is quite broad. Um, and so one of the um, benefits we felt from having Michael Baylor present on core competencies is to help us kind of put a framework around that. Um, and so uh, Michael and his colleague um, Aaron did also do a little work kind of mapping that to the criteria so that we can make sure it aligns so that if we do 
um, or if we are able to adopt that framework into our review, um, we know that there is a sort of a clear alignment to um, what we're required to review under the statute. Slide seven is an overview of our debrief discussions from the FY21 process. So we had discussions with um, OneCare uh, as well as the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and then our um, Green Mountain Care Boards or staff teams that work on ACO oversight to try to understand um, you know, what, uh, how things went, what could be done better, what we can bring forward into the next process. And here's a, here's a summary of what, what we came up with. Um, with our discussion with OneCare, the highlights included um, uh, improvement in regulatory and contractual alignment. So uh, again, um, this is um, understanding how the ACO process um, overlaps and aligns with our hospital budget process or rate review process, um, but also recognizing that um, OneCare has contractual agreements with the payers um, and oversight by um, Department of Vermont Health Access and Medicaid. And so we were working to understand um, those uh, requirements as well so that it can be aligned. Um, in addition, we've done work with OneCare on business process alignment, so understanding when during the year certain things happen um, so that we are aligning our deadlines with when things happen in their um, contracting cycle. Um, and the third kind of piece that fits in there is template alignment. So where they report to payers or where they report under other contracts, we're working to align those reporting templates. Um, and all of these three things, to, these things together, regulatory, contractual alignment, business process alignment, and template alignment, um, we believe is leading to uh, administrative, uh, reducing of administrative burden and regulatory burden on reporting. It's, I will admit, it's quite a lot of work to, to sort of get there um, in working toward this alignment, but the, the goal, I think, will make things um, cleaner um, and better aligned and ultimately reduce um, burden and improve um, the reporting. Um, we also discussed with OneCare uh, ways to improve the narrative portion of their budget submission, in particular, providing uh, rationale for changes that are being made, um, discussing the why. Um, and so those, those are ongoing discussions to try to get at um, improved narrative. As um, Michael Bailet said as well, not everything can be reduced to a metric or a key performance indicator. Um, there has to be a you know, substantive discussion, uh, uh, particularly about non-financial um, programs and, and changes there. And so um, working together to sort of improve that narrative um, is a priority. Um, transparency, of course, um, as well, um, making sure that the um, um, the correspondence on the deliverables, what is due when, what comes in, making sure those are posted so that members of the public can see them um, is uh, a priority, um, as well as evolving business model and strategic planning, discussion of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, we know that um, OneCare is undergoing a strategic planning process. Um, that is a priority. So um, that is something that we look forward to seeing in this coming process as well. Um, our discussion with the healthcare advocate, I pulled out sort of three uh, bullets here. Um, we've been working with them towards a collaborative and transparent question and response period. Uh, as you know, the healthcare advocate has a role in questioning the ACO and reviewing their materials as well. We've worked with them closely over the past couple of years to improve that question and answer period so that our questions are aligned. Um, as well as they have the ability to ask questions that are um, um, of particular relevance or importance to their work. Um, and I think that we have made some improvement there and will continue that process. Um, we've also discussed with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate um, ways to improve interpretation of data trends over time, um, particularly in light of the COVID-19 disruption over this past year. We know that is will you know have a big effect on how um, performance metrics are you know interpreted and reported um, or not reported in some cases, and so we were working with them on how best to interpret that um, data 
um, because it's it's the reality. Uh, and also um, the elevating the public comment and the consumer experience of being in the ACO um, is a priority that comes out of our discussions with the healthcare advocate. Um, and we um, want to make sure that that you know we're able to incorporate that um, into our process um, to the best um, to the best we are able. Uh, the things down at the bottom under Green Mountain Care Board, these are some of our discussions that we've had among the uh, processes within the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, they include things I've, I've already mentioned, um, improving regulatory alignment, working towards standard reporting metrics and definitions, data-driven analysis and decision-making, um, collaborating across teams as well as agencies, improving transparency, um, as well as incorporating where appropriate expert consultation. And again, um, that is, is illustrated by having um, Michael Bailett with us today. Um, and uh, you know, as we go forward, considering how we can best use expert consultation to improve on our oversight and evaluation of the ACO. So this is the frame within which we um, are going into our uh, 2022 uh, budget season. So this slide has a lot of words on it, but let me describe what we are doing here. Um, so first of all, the FY22 guidance will be based off of the FY21 outline. Um, this makes sense because the FY21 guidance was prepared in the context of the public health emergency, um, which we are still in um, and still dealing with. Progress was made on all of the goals that we set out uh, to achieve in 2021, um, and that progress will carry forward. So um, you'll see here I have the, the slides that I already mentioned, or sorry, the priorities that I already mentioned at the top of this slide. Um, in 2021, we uh, identified the goals that you see on the left there. Um, and like I said, there has been a lot of um, progress, which I've, I've already discussed uh, somewhat made on those goals. A lot of them will, you know, carry forward. Um, you know, for example, um, making sure to break out information requests across processes categorically to ensure rule five regulatory requirements. Obviously, we're going to continue to do that, emphasizing data over narrative where we can, um, while also improving the narrative, um, streamlining our information requests across the regulated entities. These are things that we've, we've been working on and plan to continue to work on. Um, I don't need to name them all. Um, I will say, um, so last year, um, the staff produced guidance with the goals of increasing transparency, reducing administrative burden, while helping the board and the public understand how the ACO is adapting its operations, given the COVID-19 public health emergency and the reduced ability of hospitals to take on financial risk. Um, this year, the question around COVID-19 impact and the public health emergency is perhaps a little bit different. Um, the ACO is um, a year into adapting its operations around the new normal for providers. So our question is, um, how do we shape this year's guidance around the current state of the pandemic? Um, questions such as what was put on hold that might be reengaged? What are the impacts on provider network and capacity? How has the public health emergency affected performance? Or what impact does the ACO anticipate? this might have on performance. Um, what is the impact of reduced care overall in 20 to 21? Um, so that is a question um, that we do want to uh, hopefully discuss and maybe hear some input on this year. How does, how does um, the uh, COVID-19 apply to the ACO in the, tw in the 2022 budget guidance? Um, this is something we'd like to hear sort of weigh in on last year it was a little bit more around reducing administrative burden i think this year it's it's probably more around um, understanding the impact but we would like some input on that um, we would also like some input on how you would like to incorporate the core competencies um, that michael bailey discussed into the guidance and review um, is that something you know it, to, to what level do we have the ability to incorporate that um, this year um, and we can we can see what we can do or how we could um, make a plan to incorporate it over time. Um, other things, other issues that might apply that are happening um, and other processes with the board uh, include hospital sustainability work, 
um, as well as a reminder that 2022 is the last year of the current all payer model agreement. So um, does that um, factor into our guidance um, this year and in what way? We can come back to that um, you know, during the discussion if we need to for reference, but I'll complete my remarks um, just by sort of reminding you of what the two um, pieces of guidance look like. So this is last year's 2021 certification eligibility verification um, outline. Um, just as a reminder, certification is a one-time thing that happens, um, which uh, OneCare was certified in 2018. Um, however, they are required to um, sort of renew, or we call it um, verify their eligibility for certification each year. And what that looks like is a form that we create um, that um, they fill out, giving us um, updated policies and procedures that allow us to um, check that they still meet the requirements of certification. Um, we also ask questions um, you know, specific to um, certification requirements that we want to look at in more detail. For example, the interpretive guidance that you heard about from Russ um, will be incorporated into the certification this year. Um, so we're in the, in the process of putting together that form, which will also be um, reviewed and completed by July 1. And then the FY21 uh, ACO budget guidance, this was the table of contents. There were eight sections um, that um, we collected data and narrative on. Uh, currently, the current uh, draft that we're working on um, uses these same sections um, with small tweaks um, for things that um, you know, we're discussing now or want to hear from today, hear from you today about changes that we can make. Uh, actually, I guess before public comment, there'd be questions from the board, but this is our overview for today. Um, I don't know if Elena wants to make any other remarks or we can just go directly to board member questions or feedback on anything that you've heard today and how you'd like that incorporated into the guidance. Um, and we will take your feedback and as well as we can take uh, public comment today on any input that the public would like to give into the guidance. Okay, Only board. I think we can go right into discussion if you're ready, Chair Mullen. I am. Go ahead, board members. Well, this is Robin. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so I think you're right, Marissa, that I'll just start with uh, the questions that you asked for some feedback on. Um, that the question around COVID-19 is different this year. And I think having an understanding of um, we certainly heard in last year's uh, discussion and testimony about different programs that were not expected to be as robust or put on hold due to the pandemic and the limited capacity for provider organizations to uh, work on quality improvement and delivery change. So I think having an understanding of where people are at. Certainly when we were doing the hospital budget guidance, we heard from regulated entities in that process that there was a substantial amount of fatigue at the individual provider level due to the stresses and frequent operational shifts due to COVID-19. So having an understanding of how that will impact the ACO's uh, progress and performance would be good. Um, I wonder if also um, there's an opportunity to hear a little bit about lessons learned and um, areas of performance that could be strengthened uh, moving forward. I think we usually try to get at that pretty much every year, but given that 22 is the last year of the current agreement, it would be good to hear that now. Um, and then lastly, on the core competencies, um, uh, one thing I'm, I'm wondering if you, you may have already discussed with Michael or at the staff level is what I heard Michael suggest was a deeper qualitative dive that was not necessarily an annual process, but a periodic process. And 
I'm wondering if that fits better conceptually into certification um, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe in addition to understanding and certification, which pieces have changed doing that more qualitative uh, dive in different aspects. So that's just a question, not for an answer necessarily today, but I guess um, having a sense of whether those five domains, whether they fit more in certification versus budget would be helpful to me. Um, I think uh, we have some work to do to take the high level concepts and drill them down into actionable regulatory items. I know certainly one thing that we've been working on improving in our process every year is um, ensuring that that our um, background or backup material for each of the statutory requirements is clear and um, that we're receiving that. So I think with qualitative stuff, it can be a little bit tough to figure out how to document that. Um, so I think for me, I. I would want us to take the time that we need to figure out, to Jess's question to Michael, how to really operationalize that in a meaningful way um, and not necessarily rush to restructure the guidance this particular year. Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Other members of the board? Okay, we're going to open it up for public comment. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, um, we're going to move on. I, I think that uh, people must be uh, looking forward to the 2019 expenditure analysis and uh, we're going to go right to that. So, um, Lori Perry, thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Elena. Lori. Sure. Can you see my screen? Um, we can see a picture of you. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Still me or the slides? It is a slide. Good, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will be presenting with David Glavin. He's going to have a few slides to show you on our um, interactive visualization. So this presentation is the 2019 Vermont Healthcare Expenditure Analysis. Um, these are the topics I will be covering today. The interactive, as I mentioned, David will cover that. I'll give you a summary of what happened in the expenditure analysis. We'll talk about what's the relationship of the expenditure analysis to the all-payer model, hospital budgets, and insurance rates. Then I'll dive deeper into the Vermont resident analysis, showing you the spending and growth, and then how do we compare it to CMS's NHE accounts. Then into the Vermont provider analysis, and I'll show you the revenue growth from the different providers, hospital and physician revenues, the migration of hospital inpatient discharges, and show you the comparison of the resident analysis to the provider analysis and why they're different. And then um, the part of our statute is to give a projection for fiscal year 19 through 2020. And then um, further on into the slide deck, we have an appendix that has more documents and methodologies for your review. Um, the healthcare expenditure analysis has been in statute of some form or another since 91. We've been doing it um, either under BISCA or DFR, and now the Green Mountain Care Board is responsible for presenting the expenditure analysis. This report is consistent. Um, that's why some people value it more because of the consistency and we examine the trends in spending, the sources of funds. We analyze broad sectors of provider and 
facilities like hospitals, physicians, mental health, home health, and pharmacy. And we also look at the payers that are paying for those services, such as Medicare, Medicaid, commercial payers, self-insured, and HMOs. We quantify the spending for all these services provided by Vermont residents and non-residents and for the services provided by Vermont providers to, out of, to these out-of-staters. And also um, we have um, services to Vermonters that are outside of Vermont. This um, data or this analysis relies on the integrity of the information collected directly from the payers and the providers. And in some cases, it's very limited. So we have estimates such as for independent physician revenues and out of pocket. This report compares Vermont data to the national data received from CMS. And we use the health consumption expenditures instead of the health, health expenditures because we don't have information on spending for investments research structures and equipment like the federal government does. And now I'd like to present David Glavin. Are you there, David? You know, I have a tendency to do this all the time. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> I, was on, I was on mute. I got to make sure that I'm presenting when I present because I'll I'll start into the presentation and nobody will be able to see anything. So I definitely will call out prior to doing that. Um, I just want to say hi to everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Lori, for um, for the introduction. And I'm just going to cover um, just two elements. I want to discuss our um, our new um, access to the to to the reports. Um, something that we're trying to update. And I want to. I've spoken about this in previous board meetings, but I just want to um, bring light to it again. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this point. And let me know if everybody can see the screen now. Yes, we can. OK, great. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do is make access to our reports um, a lot easier and more streamlined. Um, you know, the. And this is not just for the interactive visualizations um, or interactive reports. This is also for the general reports. Of course, the GMCB produces um, um, many reports during the course of the year and, of course, over time. And so what we want to try to do is, um, is drive traffic to those reports. And so part of that is, is this layout that we've, we've now created here. Um, this one is for the expenditure analysis in particular. And what we kind of think of this as one-stop shopping. Um, this, I also want to point out, this is, um, and this is very important, is that this particular page is just for the resident perspective of the expenditure analysis. We're hoping down the road to provide the, or to develop a, the provider perspective as well um, in both an interactive window and also, um, and also just as the report page, as part of the report, general report page for the expenditure analysis. Um, but. Like I said, this is a kind of one-stop shopping where we do, and we've laid it out so that we have um, the data elements are here that are used to generate the report. They're available to the public. Um, in addition to that, all of the supporting documentation, and this is, uh, or for this particular for this report, um, the report itself, the manual, and then a link to the historic or previous reports. Um, and this is going to be consistent through. Um, we're trying to make this consistent throughout all of our reporting pages. Um, and so the next piece of this I want to highlight is actually the interactive window or the inter interactive report itself. Um, one of the elements that we have, or, or one of the things that we've incorporated into the into the page now, um, in the past um, we've had to, we're, we, have, we have been publishing our reports um, through a third party vendor that we use, I don't want to even call it a vendor, but just through a third party public resource um, where the reports reside. In the past, you've had to click on a hyperlink that would take you to that um, report page. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is make it very easy so that you didn't feel like you were leaving the GMCB um, web page, and so that the report now launches um, directly from what we call a modal box. And so you never actually leave the website itself and you access the report right away. I've actually got this pre-opened to the second slide, but there are um, 
an assortment of slides here. I'm going to expand this in just a second, just to let folks know that there's a there are tabs that have different types of analyses and different um, overviews of the analyses across the top here. Um, so very quickly, one of the things that we do encourage people to do is, is go to the full screen mode. And I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit. I think we've tested this. Um, hoping folks can see that a lot better. Um, so just a few things that we've updated in this particular report, try to make it a little bit cleaner and a little bit more, a lot more user friendly, hopefully. Um, I've added a few elements in, in terms of um, how to use the dashboard, dashboard, which we didn't have before, or they were sort of, um, they were kind of hidden inside of these, what we call tool tips when you hover over particular bars, it gives you some instruction. Um, and without going into too much detail, I think people are very um, familiar with the interactive reports, but, um, or with interactive reports in general, we see them in the New York Times and all, um, you know, you see them online and websites. So, you know, we have filter elements and this is on all the pages. In addition to that, these bars as well provide filter elements over here for these area charts, um, which provide a, a visual distribution of each independent um, provider um, for a particular year. Um, and I want to just make a very um, important clarification about the interactive reports. Um, these are not a replacement or a, uh, you know, obviously not a replacement for the main report, re report itself. These are, this is a supplement to the report. Um, and we think of this as a, I, I like to think of it as a consolidation of the data elements and supporting graphs and tables and charts that Lori has developed um, for people to quickly be able to access the report data elements and not have to dig through the more formal report write up um, to find these charts. So, um, so this is these these interactive um, reports are are a supplement and they're 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 really um, they're really to, to be used in conjunction with the supporting material, including the report and the manual as well. So I want to encourage people as they go through these to put the re, the visualization elements in, in the context of the report itself. Um, I believe Lori has a hyperlink to the reports page um, built into the slide deck that has been um, sent out. So I'll let people go ahead and um, peruse through that um, at their own leisure. And if there are any comments, we, um, we encourage people to um, provide comments back on any way that we can improve these reports. Um, for general um, general users, especially for the public, which is the primary goal or is the primary um, um, focus for these reports to provide that open and transparent access to our data and to the reports themselves for the public. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the um, the rest of the expenditure analysis back over. Really. Actually, I want to I want to um, give a shout out to one of my coworkers, Je Jessica Mendezabel, who is um, responsible for actually developing these pages, putting these pages together and doing the code behind the pages, um, the web page to, to create this much cleaner look and easier accessible look for everyone. And Lori, it is all yours. I'll stop sharing now. If I can find the stop sharing. Can you see my slide deck? Yeah, now? Just, yeah. page? Yes. Okay, down at the bottom of that page that is in the presentation is the link to what David just showed us. So if you wanted to link to the, from this presentation. So this was what David just showed us, but it's in the slide deck. And so now I'll go on to the summary of the report. Um, for the resident analysis, I found that the Vermont spending increased 4.1% from 2018. And this was um, higher because 2018 had an increase of 1.9% from 2017. The average increase for the period 2014 through 19 was 3.3%. I found that commercial insurance spending increased 3.7%. And it seemed as if it was more mainly from hospitals, drugs and supplies, physicians and other unclassified. The um, categories that decreased was admin and net cost of health insurance and other professionals. Medicare spending increased 6.3%. And this was seen in drugs and supplies, home health, other unclassified and physicians. And then there was decreases in nursing homes and hospitals. Medicaid spending increased 2.9% and as expected increases were in mental health and other government activities, hospitals, 
nursing homes, but decreases in physicians and admin net cost of health insurance. I like to bring to people's attention that this R at the bottom of certain slides mean it's looking at the resident analysis data and um, it'll change when you wanna see provider analysis data. Um, then we show the Vermont compared to the United States CMS data. And as I just mentioned for Vermont, it increased 4.1% for spending compared to 2018. The United States increased 4.5% and I was using health consumption spending. The, um, the United States increased 4.7% from 2017 to 18. So this was slightly less for the United States. On a per capita basis or per person, Vermont is $10,442. And this was an increase of 4.5% from 18. The United States was um, at a lower per capita of 10,000. I mean, we were lower than the United States and that was 10,967. Um, when we compare the gross domestic product, Vermont is at 19.2% in healthcare and the United States is 16.8%. Um, when we look at the provider analysis, we are looking at the health service revenues that the providers received for in and out of state patients. And this increased 5.7% in 2019. And this was an average annual increase of 4.2% for the period 2014 through 2019. We saw growth in hospitals um, increase 4.2%. And this category includes the hospital employed physicians. The other categories that saw increases, now this is just increases, is 25% for vision and DME. Drugs was 11.8%, and which includes supplies. And then other licensed professionals was 6.7%. Nursing homes was 5.8%. Dentists, 4.6%. And home health, 34 Then physicians, 1.7%. Um, I'd like to point out that this all was before the pandemic, so it'll be interesting to see what's going to be happening in fiscal years tw uh, 20 and 21 compared to this 19 data. We, let, we wanted to give you an idea or to uh, the differences between the expenditure analysis and the all-payer model total cost of care. So um, the Expenditure analysis on the resident side is for all residents, where the total cost of care is only 75% of the residents because it excludes people who don't have insurance, like uninsured, and then also payers that are not in the all payer claims database. The other uh, difference is this is the expenditure analysis is based on health consumption where the total cost of care all payer model is 46% of the health consumption expenditures. And this is limited to medical claims for services that are similar to or covered by Medicare parts A and B and non-claims payments from primary care. In the expenditure analysis, I include Medicare Advantage within Medicare because that's where the Medicare beneficiary is, where in the total cost of care all payer model, it is included in the commercial payer. The expenditure analysis versus the hospital budgets. Um, the expenditure analysis shows all the hospitals, which includes Brattleboro Retreat, the community hospitals and Vermont Physician Care Hospitals. Greenmount Care Board only regulates the 14 community hospitals. And the expenditure analysis is for calendar year 2019. And then the hospital budgets are for federal fiscal year 2019. So you, we have difference, little differences, but we don't usually correct for that. And then the expenditure analysis includes all the financial information associated with the facilities. So for instance, I'm taking into consideration net patient revenue plus other operating revenue for the hospitals. On the hospital budget side, we're only regulating basically the net patient revenue. And we try and 
do that through commercial charges. The expenditure analysis, when you compare it to the insurance rate review, is that we, in the expenditure analysis, I include all commercial plans, which even include workers' comp. The insurance rate review is only limited to qualified health plans and fully insured products based in Vermont. The expenditure analysis like is uh, for the calendar year 2019, where the 2019 medical expenditures are used for this last year's estimate for premiums for 2020-21 in the insurance rate review process. The um, expenditures for the expenditure analysis includes all of the expenditures for Vermonters for even their services that are outside of Vermont too. But also the expenditure analysis includes Vermont providers that are include um, providing services to out of state patients, where the insurance rate review is only for plans that are for Vermont residents that are not necessary for Vermont residents, but may be having an employer within Vermont. So into the growth for the 2019 resident analysis, this slide is showing the payers on the top from 2014 to 2019, and in the bottom section is the providers and facilities for 2014 through 19. So when I mention the growth from 18 to 19 is 4.1%, you'll see it matches up. And then the average annual change from 14 to 19 is 3.3%. Um, the I show this slide to just kind of emphasize the change from 2000. That one was 2014 to 19. This is 2011 to 19. And the drastic, the quite the change is in 2011 we were 5 billion, and now we're at 6.5 billion. And the average annual increase was 3.4% for this time period. And where, and again, I'm mentioning that the change between 18 and 19 is 4.1%. So showing you the dollars and the percentage change on this slide. These are the individual categories and the total of the spending for in and out of state spending for Vermonters and hospitals are the highest as expected and other unclassified would be the low. But this slide, um, slide 15, we're showing what is, what was the categories that increased? So I saw that drugs and supplies was a big category that increased this year and it was mainly from Medicare and commercial insurance and then out of pocket. Hospitals were the next, they increased in the commercial pairs and out of pocket and then Medicaid. You know, so don't say Medicare. Um, med mental health and other government activities as expected is from Medicaid. And then the other unclassified, I mainly saw those increased in commercial and Medicare. And then home health increased in Medicare and out of pocket. This slide is showing you that maybe like commercial was 33% of the total spending for 2019, but they made up 50% of the enrollment. For Medicare, 24% of the spending for the um, 2019, but Medicare was 23% of enrollment. And that's what this slide is trying to show you. Then um, I try and show you where is the funding coming from, which is the top pie charts, and then where is it going? So you can try and match up these as best as you can. This is also a slide that the CMS was using also similar, so I tried to use it for what we have in the Vermont residence analysis. So I'm going into slide 18 and starting the commercial insurance pair where I saw the spending increase in the different changes. So for commercial insurance, that increased $75.2 million or 3.7%. And it was 2.1 billion of the total spending. And most of this was in hospitals 
drugs and supplies, and other unclassified, and then physicians. But then I saw decreases, a large decreases were in admin and net cost of health insurance and other professionals. So you can see that down at the bottom here and then at the top. The, we'd like to find out where is commercial resident, commercial um, spenders or our residents, where are they having their care? And I found that it was 75% previously, now it's only 72% within Vermont. And that I saw that the commercial enrollment decreased 0.4% from 2018. So it's now 313,605. Of course, these are estimates also. The Medicare was increased 95.1 million or 6.3%. And this makes up 1.6 billion for total spending, and I mainly saw the increases in drugs and supplies. And a big thing in this particular category is I'm seeing a lot of supplies, and we're going to be investigating that more and more because that that is really hard to understand, and we're going to be investigating it more. Um, we understand drugs because we've also been hearing about that from the hospitals and pharmaceuticals that it's increasing. Um, so for Medicare, we also saw increases in other unclassified home health physicians, other professionals, and then their admin net cost of health insurance. But I saw decreases in, which I was a little surprised, in nursing homes and hospitals and dentists. The in-state spending for Medicare remained at about the same at 73% from previous years. And then the enrollment increased to 141,895 or 3.9% from 2018. Medicaid increased 49.1 million or 2.9%. And this was a total of 1.7 billion for total spending in Vermont for 2019. And I saw, as expected, increases in mental health and other government activities hospitals, nursing homes, and other professionals, and um, some in and other professionals. Excuse me, this is wrong, where it says home health. Um, spending decreased in physicians, admin net cost of insurance, but I'm seeing a decrease in home health, drugs, and supplies, because they also are showing uh, rebates in the drugs and supplies here. And of course, as we expect, Medicaid has 86% um, of their spending is with Vermont providers. And Medicaid enrollment decreased this year, 148,689 or 4% from 18. This slide um, I try and show because it's such a big category, mental health and other government health activities is to show that it's mainly in, most of the spending is in mental health clinic, and community rehab treatment, day treatment. Then they have categories called home and community-based care, such as aged and disabled, enhanced residential care, and assistive community care. So these are the increases that we saw for those type of categories. Um, but I did see decreases in managed care organizations and then the other mental health and substance abuse services. And again, this is for 2019. This slide is showing the net admin net cost of insurance. And I found through the years that the surpluses for the change in their surpluses for the insurers, commercial insurance, is what causes a lot of this swing in the last few years. And you can also see on the bottom slide, we're trying to show you what makes up that net cost of health insurance for commercial payers. And the gray part is the change in their surplus. So these, these categories can usually be, um, one second. It's, it's like their investments, it's their changes in their reserves, it's their taxes. It can also be some of the ACA fees can cause some of these changes. So um, just wanted to give it, in context, whenever you see these changes in net um, 
admin and net cost of health insurance, but it, we'll also see some of these swings in the other government payers. The um, health care analysis, I try and show what happened in 2014 and 19, where the payers, what shifted, and I saw that commercial insurance paid 35% in 2014, where in 2019 it was 33% of the spending. In um, this one was a, a quite a shift with 21% in Medicare in 2014. Now it's 25%, and we 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 realize that because the Medicare population in our um, aging population. This one is showing then what is what has changed in the provider categories from 2014 to 2019. So our hospitals were 37% in 2014, and they dropped a little bit to 36% in 2019. And I found that drugs was 12%, drugs and supplies was 12% in 14, and now it's 15% in 19. And I bet it's going to be even more in the next few years. This slide is showing by the um, provider service categories. Who is making up most of the spending? Is it government funding or is it private funding? And private funding also includes out of pocket. So as expected, mental health and other government activities is mainly Medicaid and state government and fe some federal. And for the dentist, you would expect it to be private um, commercial insurers and out of pocket. So this is just a quite a contrast of where public payers versus private are um, funding different categories. Now I'm transitioning into the national health expenditure accounts compared to Vermont residents expenditures. And this year I found um, when I wanted to compare what I had previously mentioned in two, the 2018 expenditure analysis, that things had changed. So I went researching and I found that the NHE Every five years, they do a comprehensive revision. So um, that is because of the census and other information that they have been able to obtain to change their estimates and everything like that. I noticed they changed how um, the rebates were accounted for in drugs and supplies, and I saw a little bit of changes in hospitals. So that's why I mentioned this is because I thought that any researchers should take caution when they want to look back at some of the previous expenditure analysis compared to what I'm showing this year for those same years that it changed. And uh, this is where we want to emphasize what is happening in the ha national health expenditures, what categories are measured each year, What's the type of data that is being used? And then to emphasize that the CMS does a state health expenditures, but it's only every five years. And when you compare Vermont to those, we have we have more detail. We have when we are using the national consumption expenditures instead of the national health expenditure, which is at the higher categories. So this is emphasizing that again. We're using this middle line, this middle bar, because we don't have investments in research structures and equipment. Or currently we don't. So this slide is showing you if you take the health consumption expenditures and the federal government increased 4.5%, Vermont in comparison increased 4.1%. And then the per capita for um, the United States is 10,967, Vermont is 10,442. The United States increased 4% and we increased 4.5%. And then Vermont gross domestic product as a percentage, excuse me, healthcare as a percentage of gross domestic product is 19.2% and the United States is 16.8%. We are also more generous in our Medicaid, and that's part of the reason why we are higher than the average in the CMS calculations. Um, this one is just another look. Um, people want to see this back in time. 
So this is showing from 2010 to 2019 and the different categories of um, expenditures, the different looks. The, this one is showing the spending growth over time from 2011 to 2019. Um, Vermont versus the United States. Vermont is the darker line and the United States is the light blue. Uh, and I want to emphasize, as you'll see in all these slides, I'm using health consumption expenditures. So um, in 2019, Vermont's per capita, as I've mentioned, growth of 4.5% was more than the 3.5% average annual increase from 2011 to 2019. The U.S. per capita growth of 4% is um, was a slight 0.1% more than their 3.9% average annual increase for the same time period of 2011 to 2019. Another look at per capita, so you could see the actual dollars per capita. And then this one is the gross state product or gross domestic product and um, give it from 1996 to 2019. If you had a Pre, if you had picked up the previous slides or what we gave you previously, excuse me, I had to update this this morning. It wasn't taking into 2019. Then the provider analysis. Again, this is patients coming to Vermont. We're using Vermont providers. So this is Vermont providers revenues. Where What payers are they receiving their revenues from? And then this is the providers who increased or or um, which ones make up most of the revenues received during the different years. So this year it increased 5.6% from 2018 and it was 4.2% average annual change from 2014 to 2019. Um, the revenues increased 5% from 5 billion in 2010 to 6.8 billion in 2019. This was an average increase of 3.9%. And this was, an, like I just mentioned previously, is 5.6% increase from 2018. This slide is showing the total dollars of spending by provider category, and then also showing it what is it make up in the percentage of the pie in the total spending. So as we've always said, hospitals is 46% of the pie, and this is all the hospitals in this particular category. And drugs and supplies is 15%. This slide is showing, uh, I wanted to show hospital physician revenue. So of the 2018 physician census that the Department of Health uh, shows they report 2,473 providers, but there's only 1,368 FTEs practicing in Vermont. And based on our hospital budget information, there's 1,135 FTEs that are employed in our community hospitals, or 83%. And this doesn't include travelers or locum tenants. The community hospital's physician revenues it increased from 36% in 2011 to now it's 50% of the revenues in 2019. This is a newer slide. I hadn't showed this one before. I'm showing you the FTE staff from our hospital budget information that there are 15,030 FTEs which includes 282 travelers or 2% of their staff. We're hearing this is increasing more and more each year. And then in comparison, in 2015, the hospital staff was only 13,638 and the travelers was half. It was 141 in 2015. But I also wanted to show you the pieces of, this is a tree chart of, um, staffing in our community hospitals. All other FTEs would be like administration, um, 
that are in others like facilities, maintenance, things like that that are not included in these other categories. Um, we like to hear from the hospitals for in migration from um, outer staters. And I've showed this slide in the last few years. This one I'm showing from 2017 to 2019. So like for instance, um, Southwestern Medical Center in 2017 was showing 32% of their patients were coming from out of state. Now it's 28%. But on average, bo through both years, it's 13% across our hospitals in Vermont community hospitals. Um, a lot of um, people wonder how come, what's the shift between the resident analysis and the provider analysis? How come it's so different? Um, some of it you will see in the resident side, there's nothing here under hospital physicians because this is being reported under physicians, this category here, but also on the provider side, you can see this is less for physicians because it's now included under hospitals because they're hospital employed physicians. The other th difference is you will not see admin net cost of insurance on the provider side but you do see it on the resident side. That can cause some of the change. The provider side does not include rebates for drugs and supplies, so this is a larger number. There are some of the differences. Um, because the statute told, wanted us to have projections for uh, the 2019 through 2020 and 20 to 2021, this is what I came up with. I've tried to be very cautious, but I didn't have a lot of data here. So I mainly had Medicaid and I was trying to do um, growth based on 2019 and um, cautiously giving growth for the 20 and the 21 years. Um, this is gonna be interesting to see what happens when I go to report for you next year for 20. On the provider side, we at least have the hospital budget information. So I could give you that for 20. And um, I did my best on trying to give some kind of a growth, but didn't go wild because of the pandemic. So our next steps, we are working more in collaboration with other teams in the Green Mountain Care Board so that we can give you better information and um, more interactive information and that you can use the information easier. So efforts are underway to extend and enhance this to better account for changes in the payer de delivery system. A lot of what the ACO is doing in the all payer model we are partnering with more subject matter experts who can identify our needs and determine a meaningful way to address these for you. And then new methods to pilot this and to estimate and to give you a better product for even the next one in 2020. Then the rest of this is uh, appendix. It's for your information. Um, I can go quickly through it is like this. Is, some people like to see the matrix of the expenditure analysis, all the different cells, what make it up. And then that's a resident. Then also, what is the commercial insurance? What does that look like? Because I had mentioned to you about admin net cost of health insurance. So you can see here the changes that make that up, their change in surplus or admin, the negatives. And you could also see which insurers are showing more for hospitals or drugs and supplies, whatever. And then the provider analysis is saying, look, and I would emphasize the color schemes because then you will know what is estimated and what is coming directly from providers or in this case, payers. And this particular slide, uh, we're using this look this year because it's showing the health insurance coverage, and it's not showing you the, the total population, but just breaking it up with who's got the insurance coverage. And um, this information is compiled from multiple sources, as I'm noting down at the bottom here, it comes from the ASSR, the Household Health Insurance Survey, comes from VCURES, DIVA, 
And then in the past, we used to use Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Now we're using VCURES. Then I'm showing you the different sources for my methods and, and notes and what might change and what we are going to be trying to get better um, sources for some of these things that we're having to calculate because we don't have direct sources. And I'd like to acknowledge all of my fellow team members in the Green Mountain Care Board for helping me, for giving me peer review suggestions and things like that. I also reach out to the Agency of Human Services for a lot of information. I reach out to individual provider agencies. I reach out to the commercial payers and they all help to inform this particular analysis. So questions. Okay, board members, are there questions for Lori? Uh, yeah, I've got you. Um, first, thank you very much. It was very comprehensive, as always, this uh, this deck is. Um, going back to looking at, you know, I guess the two biggest drivers of the change year over year were the drugs and supplies and the hospitals. And the drugs and supplies were up uh, 135 million. And do we have any color on, you know, understanding if those are specialty drugs or you know, what's driving that huge change? And it's it's been something that's been happening for the past several years. Not in the data that I have, because I'm only, I have not asked that specific. I'm only asking what's the particular categories that they're seeing the spending in. Um, the CMS will say that it, that's a lot of the, the drivers is your specialty drugs. If you look at their, um, re, um, literature so that would be true okay. and the other thing maureen is as i mentioned is the um a team and i are also looking at the supplies piece of that because that feels squishy we'll call it if you want to use that terminology because it just is weird and i want to dig deeper into that but that's part of that growth it's growing more than i'm comfortable with Okay, and another part, and I'm I'm going to look at both the um, the drugs and then and then do the same for hospitals. So in the 135 million increase that we had for drugs, and then when we go down to the payer type reimbursements, 23 of that was in commercial, and then when we get into Medicare, it was the bulk of it, 79. Or 69, and then um, the drug piece was actually down slightly for Medicaid. But the question is, I wonder if when we look at the reimbursements, if the reimbursements and the increases um, are more are absorbed more evenly across the payers. And let me contrast that with hospital spending, the hospital increase. So the hospital increase was uh, 91 million. And of that 91 million in the hospital increase, commercial picked up 63 million of that change. Yet commercial lost a uh, number of people who are covered under commercial year over year. So the, you know, the bulk of the, the hospital increases all got hit with commer by commercial. And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe because the other payers aren't really picking up much of an increase year over year, and it's all hitting the commercial payer. And don't know if you can talk to that at all. Sorry, not in this particular analysis. We can try for the future ones. Okay, so it's just something as we look at, you know, disproportionately, you know, as particularly for when we look at the hospital increase, it's two thirds of it is going to commercial payers. And relative to the fact that they're actually losing members slightly year over year, uh, to me, it, it looks like it could be because, as we know, the other payers aren't necessarily taking such large increases year over year. Um, so I think what Tom would pick up on would be the cost shift, right? For right, right there. I'm listening. So, I'm listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, that's all I have, but it, very helpful information, a lot to digest in this, but it, it always um, is, is good to look at, um, you know, in total, 
where all the spending is um, and you know how that's playing out year over year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, other board members? Yeah, maybe I'll just pick up a little bit on Maureen's thread. Um, I'm just wondering, Lori, first of all, thank you. I know how much work this is. And so I really, really appreciate all the work that you do and compiling all this data every year. Um, and I'm wondering, one of the things that I'm concerned about or just thinking about is we know that there's been a major shift from independent practices to hospital owned practices. And, um, you know, that's happened nationally, but it's also happening in Vermont. So I'm just wondering, since the hospital revenue includes revenue for hospital owned physicians, before they would have been counted, obviously, in physician revenue and in the physician bucket, but now they're being counted in the hospital bucket. Right. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Basically, we're counting them that way because we have the data in our hospital budgets. Yeah. And on the other side, for like the resident side, um, that's how the payers are accounting for them because they're seeing it in physicians. Right. I guess it also depends where the claims are going too. But yeah, you it we're seeing that, and like you said, nationally, it's almost 50-50. Right. And I guess what I'm just saying is that does that. That, in some of the analysis that's being done, does that basically overstate hospital revenue growth and understate physician revenue growth? Um, because basically what would have been counted in physician revenue growth before is now an ownership change and now it's counted in the hospital. So I'm just I'm, I'm thinking about how we look at hospital growth and physician growth over time when there's this fundamental change in ownership of physicians, but it's not a fundamental change in you know, what we think of as physician services and what we think of as hospital services. So I'm just wondering how we look over time and is there any way to unpack, you know, hospital, pure hospital growth from hospital growth that's inclusive of physician owned practices growth? Um, basically, that is a great question because we've been trying to get physician revenue from the independent physicians for many, many years and it is, uh, we have to tr probably try harder to get those sources. I've used census data. I've used uh, Department of Labor data. But also keep in mind the physician revenue side will not have a facility fee that the hospital physician side will have. There's, there's some of the increase. But you're absolutely right. We've got to try and unpack what is, where is the growth if it had remained the same. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to understand that, you know, if we really want to understand hospital services and how that's growing over time, I don't want to have counted in that bucket a hospital owned primary care practice, because that to me is is not necessarily what I'm thinking about as hospital services. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, I guess it's a it's it's a problem of, of where the data sources are. I get that. I'm just trying to think of how we unpack that. Um, I guess my my second question, my last question is, Laurie, you you know you lead this effort, and you're also one of the key members of our hospital budget team. So I'm wondering, are there particular learnings that you see, having dug into this data year after year, that we should take with us into the hospital budget process? Um, one of the things, one of the slides that I found really interesting and helpful was the the slide that had the percentage by hospital of uh, out of state res you know resident care being delivered you know like southwest being really high and um in terms of out of state the proportion of their patients that are coming from out of state and i'm just wondering that would be helpful to have in the hospital budget process as we're thinking about where is revenue coming from and there's probably other slides in here or other things in here that you you notice with your hospital budget hat on that we might remind ourselves about you know when it comes to hospital budget time and i'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that Basically, it's like your last thing that you said is remind ourselves about, but my data, this is 2019 and you're going to be 2022 budgets. So things have changed slightly. So that's where it would have been great if I could have, if we had gotten all the data for 20 and be able to inform you for 22, but that's huge wish list because we're still starting to collect that information. Um, I can, all we can say is you're absolutely right is to just give it to take into consideration these particular things when you're looking at hospital budgets, the inpatient from outer state or things like that. Yes. Yeah. But also we don't have who's going 
for these hospital budgets, who did they lose to out-of-staters? Right. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. So appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, other board members. Uh, I, I just got one question, and, and thanks again, Lori. Every year, this is just an amazing task to uh, uh, to actually see these numbers kind of tie out, you know, independent of what database that you're looking at. It's a uh, it's quite a feat. Um, but I'm I kind of this is maybe more of a uh, you know just you meet people on the street, and they're always and we're often outraged about healthcare costs going up over time. And uh, and not necessarily their particular healthcare costs, but just generic healthcare costs, which is you know what your analysis um, uh, covers. And um, but if you know as as I as you went through as I went through it and you went through it, we're looking at like 13% of the resident spend is out of pocket, um, and the commercial increases are uh, um, on a trend. You know, from 2014 to 2019, and I think at 2.1%, and uh, year over year, 3.7%. And I'm just wondering if you were one of those outraged people, where would you go in this data set to say, see, I told you so, healthcare costs are outrageous and growing at these double digit or exorbitant rates? Because I don't see that in this analysis. Uh, <laughs> I would not be able to point them to just one thing because it's it's everything. It all has to melt together and we're all paying for it, either in our premiums or our taxes. Right, I agree with that, but I, I just don't see the system growing at, at, I think, what is the popular understanding that it's growing at, at least high single-digit rates and maybe even oh, double-digit wow. rates. I, I don't see that anywhere. I think when we first started in the Green Mountain Care Board, we were seeing it, but then it started to shift because of what was happening at the government, at the federal government level too. So it's starting to probably not grow as fast, where it's slower, and that's why it's hard to look at. The data I'm giving you is one year snapshot. We should look at the trends or the trend line sometimes. and. Um, I think that we're all doing as much as we can to try and slow those curves. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I was looking at the 14 to 19, you know, uh, uh, 2014 to 2019 trends, and and uh, I, I just I just I just can't get as outraged as some some people do about it. I um, I Kevin uses the the hospital chart going back to uh, the when the Green Mountain Care Board was actually. Uh, put in play here, and it's a pretty good record, uh, um, you know, from then to now. And I, I think your data kind of affirms that. Yeah, because it includes the budget information, which also includes their other operating revenue, because we want to keep it the same as what we're asking from other providers. So what is your total operating revenue, not just NPR? You're right. Yeah. Thank you, and nice work. Thank you. Okay, other board members? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to the public for public comment. Members of the public? And I'm going to start with Rick Dooley. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I always find the numbers just you know fascinating as you go through them. I just want to, to Tom's point, um, I think the issue is if you see stuff going up, I, don't, I agree there's not these double digit increases, but you know if you see increases of, you know, two, three, four percent year after year after year after year after year, you know, three times five, you're up to 15 percent. And I don't think people are seeing wage increases of two, three, four percent year after year after year after year after year. So, you know, I think it's that's where you're seeing the disconnect is is everyone sees it in terms of percentage of their income. You know, they look at their increase in health insurance premiums. They look at their lack of increase in salary or take home pay. They look at everything else being more expensive. And I think that's where you're seeing the uh the outrage. So I agree. I don't think you can point to the numbers and say, you know, you can point and say, geez, you know, three and a half percent, that's not too bad. Four percent, that's that's not too bad. But if you haven't gotten a raise for three years, that is bad. That, that adds up. So I think that's in my mind, that's sort of where you're seeing the outrage. Just a comment, nothing to no question there. Thank you again. 
Thanks, Rick. Other members of the public? Uh, it's Walter Kevin. Go ahead, Walter. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, to Tom's point again, uh, I I think Tom is right about the Green Mountain Care Board. I just want to project what would happen if the Green Mountain Care Board had not been there. These prices probably would have gone up into the double and at least double digits, you know, teens, 20s every year. I'm seeing this in states where they don't have a Green Mountain Care Board. You know, 25, 30% is not unusual. And to so kudos to Tom for that. And to Rick's point, it's not just that our wages don't go up, which they do not. It's that we're always told that private insurance and that this system is the most efficient in maintaining costs or saving money when all it does is raise costs. And it's not only in premiums, it's in deductibles and out of pocket because when you consider all of this, most of some of us have to spend ten thousand dollars even before we can the, the insurance kicks in. So that's part of the outrage is that we first of all the insurers have shifted costs onto us. The costs keep going up and we're always being told that it's more efficient. So <clears throat> than a single payer type system. And that's where the outrage is coming from. And Rick is right about wages. You know, I haven't had a 3.5% increase in wages in probably 15 years. Wages just don't go up anymore. So that's where that's coming from. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Walter. Other members of the public? Uh, yes, Mark Stanislaus. Actually, um, I just have a quick question about these numbers. Are you able to tell the difference between utilization and rate and what impact the aging population has on it? Lori, did no. you hear that question? Yeah, yes. Um, no, we, we have nothing on utilization in these numbers. So, you know, part of the drive up of the numbers where we don't know how much of it is, is it's just the patient needs are driving the increased cost versus how much is a pure rate change. Right. No, that's the only point I wanted to make. Thank you. We also don't know if it's proper utilization or not. I mean, that's part of the problem. We don't have all the answers. Yeah, I'm just responding to the question that when you look at the total cost that you need to break it down and that's an important point, Kevin. And we also don't know if if uh, we'll hear what we heard earlier from a private ACO saying um, they went out of they basically went out of business because they felt their utilization of cost were good too. So I mean, there's a lot of variables here, and and it's complicated. I mean, it really is. And Mark, uh, your line of question gives me a chance to actually say some positive things that have not been picked up in the local press. But there is a, a national study that came out that showed that Vermont um, is doing an incredible job of not doing over hospital use in that um, it's across the, the Vermont uh, hospital system, but also um, both UVM and Dartmouth were in the top 15 um, academic uh, medical centers uh, tier of uh, keeping the uh, improper use down. So. Um, it's a, a good story, it's just nobody's talking about it. Well, thank you for the sharing that, Kevin. We appreciate it. Okay. Well, and that's good to for, hear that both of thank our Thank you for being at the right side of the list. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's good to hear that both of the, the state's tertiary care facilities are falling in the same category, too. So that's another good story for the state, I think. Yep. Okay, hey, other members of the public. Hearing none, um, Lori, um, I'm sure we're going to have more questions as we uh, ponder this over the next few days, and uh, we know how to get a hold of you. And uh, 
I want to thank uh, David and Jess for their assists and everybody across all the teams and throughout state government that you work with to compile this report every year. Um, it's one of the reports that uh, I really look forward to every year. And that's that's probably not a good thing to publicly admit that, but it, it really um, helps me to understand where we're headed. I'm, a, I'm actually a little bit uh, uh, down um, because we had made some progress as a percentage of our gross domestic product in 18, and uh, that slipped away in 19. Um, but when you look at the rest of the country, we're still doing pretty darn good. And um, thank you for compiling the report. And um, at this point, I will ask if there is any old business to come before the board. Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Tom to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the day. We had hail earlier here at the start of the meeting, but it's sunny out now. <laughs> Hopefully my car didn't have any damage. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.